listening to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. Way we go. Look who's back. It's Tiny Tank is Come back on. in the house. Come on. Welcome back to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. It's the only one that brings, you know, I don't got to say the rest of it. You know it by now. Anything fire related, we bring it to you, right, Roof? We do. Self proclaimed. Best podcast. Best podcast on the earth. Oh, yeah. Or on the water. Wherever. Doesn't matter. Too soon? <laughs> I, too soon. Eh, is it too soon? Is it too soon? I mean, they started had... days ago, really. It did. I feel sorry. Say a prayer for those guys. It's just a shame. I Terrible. had a ticket to that thing, too. Like, the good thing I didn't... Uh... You did? If, with your money, you probably had three tickets, bro. Probably. You... Who else were you bringing on board with you? I don't know somebody to work the Game Boy uh, remote control. <laughs> Holy shit. Lose money, he could have retired. Oh, we don't hear from them. Where are they? Donkey Kong or something going on over there. I don't know what's going on with that oh, shit. It's crazy, man. It takes balls to go down that little metal saws each. You know what I mean? Bolt it in. I mean, in the end, it, good thing it was uh, <clears throat> quick. It quick, man. I can't imagine. I th- we were no. talking about it before. Uh, they were talking about it's being pitch black down there, no power, cold. it's hot, it's cold. Imagine it's you like, br- brought your son down there, and that's yeah. that's the way you go out. I mean, thank God it happened. Uh, yeah, they didn't know. They were crossing the pearly gates before they knew what happened, bro. Thank God. Amen. Good morning and amen. Good morning, amen, amen. and good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome back, Tank. Where you been, bro? I was hanging out, man. Like, what are you going, going to fires? I have been to a few fires, yeah. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I know what the questions he's going to ask. I know what they are. I do too. You went to some fires, you said. Let me see if I'm right. Go ahead. Did you see flame? Yes. Did you put your (laughs) Did you put your face piece on to stay alive? To stay alive. Yes. Wow. All right. So maybe you went to a couple of jobs then. Maybe. Good for you, you, Tanky. It wasn't a trailer, was it, or a shed? Double wide. It was. uh, Was it a double wide? It was a. Two and a half story, all right. Like Twenty five hundred square foot house. Really? All right. Yeah. Well, one of them was the other one was um another Shed. machine fire. The uh, <laughs> the, the, the what the uh, the the moonshine still caught on fire or something down there? What happened? Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. You got gotcha. you. I'm picking it up. Well, we got a brand new segment for you tonight. We were just gonna call it, you know, the regular Frank Chief Leap, right? But Frank Leap Part Thirty Eight. Now it's it's called. <laughs> Hot off the presses with Chief. Lee. Hot off the presses because with Chief. Because this Lee. guy's got his pulse, his finger on the pulse of the job. We started off saying, hey, let's talk about this fire, this fire, this fire. Great, great, great. Then he says, I want to talk about this. And then there's this. And then I went to the Bell Club thing the other night. And then we got to talk about this. And then Metal Day. Oh, we got to talk about Mark Ferran. We got to talk about, I'm like, holy <laughs> shit, man. The show's not eight hours, bro. What are we doing here? I mean, are we gonna... so we're just going to scrap all that stuff and we're going to talk about all the current things going on in the job today. And nobody knows it better than our guest. Right what do we now. call it? Hot off the presses. Hot with off Chief the Lee. presses with Chief Lee. We should make this like a bi monthly show. Hot off the presses with we'll Chief Lee. Update the title of the show. Yeah. We can make that happen. We could. You know what else you can make happen? Commercials. I can. Do it. Yep. We got to get him in here quick because he's got so much to talk about. We don't have a one out of a pod 18, so we got to hurry up and get it all in. Do it. If you're looking for a gift for that special firefighter in your life, then head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com. Yes, GettingSaltyApparel.com. What do we have? Well, we carry hand-drawn original T-shirts, glassware such as mugs, shot glasses, pint glasses, engraved Arctic cooler cups, and much, much more. There's also a full line of firefighter tool bottle openers like Halligan's, Nozzles, and wine bottle opener accesses too. And if you're a cigar smoker, congratulations! We have partner saw cigar cutters and humidors. Think we're done? Far from it. We got toiletry, gear bags, poozies, a full line of hats, decals, sweatshirts, and once again, so much more. We can also personalize most of these products. And if you want discounts, hey, you've come to the right place. We got discounts on large orders, for promotion dinners, weddings, as well as installation dinners. Just head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com. Beautiful. Look who's back. My girl Susie's back in the chat. Ah, we missed you, Susie. Love you, kiddo. She's back. All right, is that it? We got anything else? What about the Super Chat? Tell me about that. If you got questions, don't cramp up. You know, not everybody gets Chief Lieb on. I know, you know, No Fire Radio doesn't get Chief Lieb on, bro. Only we get it. Chief of Safety. 
Trick yep. shot. Two star. What is he? Two star now? Three star? I don't three, even know what three. Three. I can't even count, bro. Yeah. Lots of stars. Any stars. Possible chief of department, maybe. Yeah. So yeah, okay. tell them about the super chat. If you have questions for the chief tonight that you just gotta have answered, hit us up in a super chat. Throw a few shekels that way. We're gonna get your question highlighted, throw it up on the screen, and the chief will answer it, or whoever the question's for will answer it. Keep it relevant, keep it respectful, and don't be a knucklehead. That's it. Oh, you're right. Those are MC, three good rules. He, he did get uh, Chief Lee on. My bad. Right. But uh, No Fire Radio didn't get him on, bro. I can tell you that much. <laughs> he didn't right. answer. You called him the other day. He didn't answer. I did speak to him. Oh, you did? Yeah. He said, you're not that important. That's why I didn't call you back. Said, he ain't oh, lying. Good, good he ain't answer. Lying. Good answer. Good for you. <laughs> good for you. I said, good for you. I'll go home and get your fucking shine box. <laughs> That's what I said to him. <laughs> All right, you want to bring him in, that guy, that fellow, you know? Let's Brooks. bring him in. He's looking good in the background. He's smiling. He's ready to go. You Luke's ready? frozen or something. No. Is oh, frozen? Lou. Lou might be frozen. Yeah, Lou's frozen. Oh, he's frozen. At least on. he's frozen with a smile on. Look at That's him. true. Now, somebody, what a cheat. I was going to say, somebody take he's a picture a of that screen. <laughs> <laughs> <He's> smiling. <laughs> Pissy pants. Is, uh, Lieutenant P All right, bring him in, Roof. Coming to the stage, Chief of Safety, Francis Lieb. <laughs> Beautiful. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, Chief Lieb. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me here today again for part three. Yes. In part the 18 part installment, I heard you say. <laughs> I'd say we're going to make this bi-monthly, hot off the presses with Chief, with Chief Lee. Maybe quarterly. Maybe quarterly. Quarterly? <laughs> <laughs> Look at his face. Is he frozen? Oh, he's not. No, he's not oh, frozen. He's just giving you the it was like this, time, it was like bro. This. <laughs> you, you know what he's actually saying? I think he's saying something like this. Hold on a minute. Oh, where did I put it? Oh, hold on. Here he is. No, you did it, you did it all wrong. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> Alright, I fucked up. This is what he's actually saying. Shut up! <laughs> Silly, Silly woman. woman. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, listen, before we get in the weeds with the silliness and all the uh, hot off the press stuff, we gotta get patriotic before Susie loses her panties over there. Yeah, there we go. Put that question on the... I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Look, even the audience is chiming to a possible name for the segment, Lessons from Lieb. I like it. Lear learning with Lieb. Learning with Lieb. Lessons from Lieb. It's all good stuff. Where do you want to start, Chief? Wherever you want to start. Actually, you know what? You know where I want to start? I want to start with uh, congratulations to all of the FDNY members who today took the deputy test. Um, I've heard from several of them, uh, including Jeff Meister, Michelle Fitzsimmons, Jeff Fascinelli. Jeff, by the way, was the uh, initial incident commander at the Twin Parks fire. Um, and John Hasney, I heard from Joe Loftus. I just heard from all of them scored in the uh, scored very well. They should all be deputies at some point. So the next generation of the FDNY, just from the preliminary results that I've seen on a deputy test, is in good hands because all of those people I just mentioned uh, are very much in promotable positions, and I appreciate them reaching out to let me know how they did because uh, they they all know that uh, I'm a big cheerleader for each and every one of them. So. Uh, maybe they're watching tonight. They're probably, hopefully, they're out celebrating and having a couple of drinks with their uh, nice. with their families or their study groups or the people that uh, that help them get where they are. You remember when you took that test way way back? When did you take the deputy test, Chief? So it's funny. I actually had to take the deputy test twice, um, and I got promoted off of the first time I took it. I got promoted. I was number 52 on the list and I got promoted on the very last day of the list. So, but I had it, I wound up taking the test, the second test. Um, and I studied hard for it. Cause I said, how can I expect them to promote me off of the first list 
if I don't do well, they'll be like, look at this dummy. He got a 56 on this test. Why would we, you know, why did we promote him? <laughs> and I wound up getting, you know, I was in the 90s on, on both exams. The difference was um, I had seniority. So uh, I went from 52 on the one list to uh, number 10 on the second list, writing the same score. So seniority matters because the assumption is seniority comes with experience in the FDNY that's 50%. Uh, that's 50% of your grade once you pass the test. So, uh, again, all of these people are fine incident commanders and will do a great job as deputy chiefs. I'm, it, it's a it's a great day for the FDNY today uh, with the deputy test over and, and hearing that the people that I know put a lot of work in uh, did well. So that's, that's Listen, great. Listen, tra- 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 as, tra- tra- as, as a chief of safety, what did you think about that uh, life-saving rope uh, rescue the other day in Brooklyn? Well... Uh, like a proud father, right? So Brooklyn needed to get into the game, right? So an engine firefighter is lowered, does a great job, saves a life. That's what saving a life looks like in the FDNY, right? I mean, it's it's a just another man. example naked. of what the FDNY way is. And it's, it's an unwavering commitment and dedication to training, to teamwork, to that reliance on our brothers and sisters, because on game day, the time to prepare is over. And it doesn't matter if you're in Queens, if you're in the Bronx, if you're in Staten Island, Brooklyn or Manhattan, it doesn't matter. We get the job done. And was, was that guy in, he was in the engine working in the truck. Is that what was happening? That's correct. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it just goes to tell you, you can't let those skills, just because you're in the engine, you need to know that, that, that evolution, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, they're you, perishable skills. If you don't train on your skills, you know, you're, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. You're never staying the way you are every single day. And you, again, you don't just get up onto the roof that day and decide, let's do a, a lifesaver rope evolution because it, it is a risky, risky uh, uh, proposition what we do. In fact, we have a um, at the fire academy, there's a plaque to Frisbee and Fitzpatrick. And uh, Tank, we should have a picture of that. Um, that's on display to remind our people. So we have more than 50 documented life-saving rope rescues since 1980. Uh, again, and since we lost those firefighters. So it is not a everyday routine um, uh, incident that we do. There's a picture that's hung at the rock. So that way our, our people remember that. We lost the firefighter from Rescue 3, and we lost the firefighter from Ladder 28, you know, um, in 1980. But we know that it, it's a, 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 a tactic of last resort, and it has it, there is a high risk um, of danger to our members anyway, and they, that, they get the job done. Is that in it's, the book? It is in the book, yes. Chief Lieb gave me this book in Syracuse. This is all of the, his bulletins, all the line of duty deaths. I can't wait to start going through that thing. Just looking at all the guys from years past that you never heard about. Yep. You know, out of, uh, I, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you how many documented ones do we have? So it's over fifty. Yeah. The, so the rope, the, the rope unit does a great job at the fire academy, and uh, they've they've documented the amount. We rarely go a year where we don't do another one, right? I mean, it was November. Now here we are doing it again. It was and a few years. So we prepare for the possible because it's 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 going to happen. It's just a matter of when. And the topography, the built environment of New York City uh, is very unique. And they were not getting to that individual if they didn't do a life-saving rope rescue because the, the line was making its way up there. It would, you know, things were happening to put the fire out. But... You saw when they removed that when they removed him from that window, you immediately saw the smoke condition behind him. He didn't even have time to put on any clothes. So you could tell like it was pretty urgent situation for that guy. He wasn't going anywhere except down. They're and always naked. We got to him before he jumped. They're always naked. It seems all that way, the time. Right? I don't know why it yeah. is. It sure but seems they're that always way. naked. Yeah. Well, don't we have a video um, of that tank? We did. Throw it up there, kid. Who who lowered him, Chief? Uh, the rest of the members from the truck, some of the members of the truck, um, I'm pretty sure. I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm not exactly positive um, who was up there. But, I mean, you see, like, they, they knew what they were doing. You see the fire, heavy fire out the window um, yeah, it there like a good and job. In, in, the, uh, in the shaft. They're getting it done. 
Okay, so in the and, video, guys, it's about a minute and a half long, and it does take a, a little bit to get panned over to the action of what's happening, so just bear with us and uh, stay with it. Here we go. And there he is, another successful, like he, like he just did it, right? Like he just did it 10 minutes before. You see the fire is still going pretty good. They got into the room next door. And, you know, just an amazing, That's what, uh, another amazing place. job. Yeah. Hey, Chief, do they have similar operations in, in other cities, you know, that they do roof rope evolutions like us? Or? I don't know of any other city that has the same uh, type of evolution that, that we have. Um, I mean, some... A lot of cities don't don't have these evolutions because they, they may not have the staffing, they may not have the building types. Uh, there's a couple of there's a couple of reasons why they may not have them. Hmm. There are some cities that have reached out to New York City uh, since last year's to try and get some information about it because they want to, um, uh, you know, because they want to get some type of a procedure in place uh, to do that. Right. What are they doing with the rope? Like, I was just going to ask that. Ten years ago, they were doing this. We we were practicing that thing. It's got to be ten years. With the, what do they call it? The LSR? Yeah, the KLSR. We're in the process of switching over to the KLSR. Um, we're, we're just more than halfway through now. Uh, that's part of Education Day currently. So we keep getting it, you know, gradually as the as the members and the battalions get trained, we're switching we're switching out the ropes. They have the ropes or just the training, you mean? They have the, some, half the companies have the rope as well. Oh, they so do. So we're switching it out as, as members learn it. We're switching it out um, as, as we move forward. So that's, you know, it takes a while to train all of the members on the job to do anything, right? Everything in the FDNY costs a lot of money, and everything takes some time because of the amount of people that you have to train. You so, guys should seriously look into this roof rope anchor that some really smart guy made on the job. It's a portable roof rope anchor that you can put anywhere on the roof, and it holds. What? what? It's, a sell it's a shameless plug? I'm sorry. A right. little bit, but they could, you know, so we you could reach out to our R&D. We have, we have an amazing Yeah, I did that. Yeah, that's division. that's that's where my idea died. <laughs> yeah, that's where <laughs> ideas go to die. That's where ideas go to die. But if you want to look at it, Chris Bodie's making it now. Well, if it's a good idea, R and R and D usually you know sticks with the good ideas. Uh, you know. Oh, oh you heard that. We'll, we'll talk. We'll, so, we'll talk. So All that's right. it. Only part three, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Did we say him? Why we said bye? Bye bye. bye. What did we say bye? Yearly? Chief, it's been great having you on. You know? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Luke. Uh, oh, shit. All right. So, all right. Moving on. So after the roof rope, what do you want to go to? How do so let's practice? go to. Give it to me. Yeah, you know what? Let's go to the uh, Firebell Club. Um, I'll take the Firebell Club Day. for a hundred. <laughs> what? I'll take the Firebell for a hundred. Okay. Game. Yeah. So. um I go to the Firebell Club. Sergio Nieto, um, uh, you know, invites me to that. See a lot of a lot of great people there. A lot of people who follow the show actually were there, and um, uh, the the medal winners. They have a couple of medal winners there, and they also they give um, the Man of the Year award to Liam Flaherty, and he gets up he gets up there, and in true Liam fashion, he gives the credit to everybody else for for different. For different things, his whole all the guests that he have are the who's who of people who've done stuff over the years for the job. You know, all the people that you would recognize. Um, he has some family members that um, 
of members that were killed in the line of duty on a job. But then he calls his wife up to the front. And you could tell, and I, I asked her later on, I'm like, you had no idea you were going up there, right? And she's like, no, I thought I was going to video from the seat. And um, he tells everybody, he says that um, the Moon family would have been there that night, but it was Billy's birthday and they didn't want to go out. So Billy passed away. Everybody is aware of that. So he took out the, she took out the phone and we sung happy birthday. And we said happy birthday to Billy. Um, and she sent that, they sent that to his, um, to his, to his widow. And I'm just like, you know, that's, that's the FDNY way, right? That's Liam. That's just, you, you think about, tell me a guy that's been more dedicated to, or, you know, more dedicated to the FDNY than him. I tell him, I'm pretty dedicated to the FDNY, but I can't even shine a candle to the way he is. And that was just another example of, of, of what he did there. Um, you know, and a medal day, um, I, I was told that, that uh, the chief of department came up with the idea that he wanted to give a medal, um, the continuation of life medal of some sort to, to his family. And they issued that medal on, on medal day. And we have, I, I have two pictures of that medal. If, if you, uh, if you have them tank the front and the back of the medal. Um, I went up and took a picture. As soon as I heard, I was floored when I heard about this medal. Wow. And that's the front of it. And um, it's just a beautiful medal. It, it, you know, it has the company's ladder 133 and rescue two on it. Um, and uh, there's the back of it. You know, it's well, just so well, others may live. Well, so others may live. Oh, yeah. that's so cool, man. Um, and so it's just, um, you know, for him to, to get up there and do that, it was just amazing. And, um, you know, medal day was, was amazing other than the fact that, it was um, a very hazy uh, day. That was the, the worst of the days with the Canadian smoke, smoke coming yeah, into yeah. New York. And um, uh, I was able to, you know, I went to, went to Metal Day and then went to the Queens Coalition afterwards. And uh, Tank, there's a picture of uh, the two guys holding the plaques. So that's, uh, you know, two guys from 117 truck, the officer and a firefighter that did a, um, you know, that did an amazing <coughs> job rescuing some civilians there. Um, I know them well from when I worked in the four nine and, and in the, uh, uh, and in the four six. Um, that might be and, one of the 900 pictures you did not send me today, chief. Is it? All right. So, um, yeah, but you know, so one of the guys is my good friend, Joe Greco did a great job, um, uh, at that fire. And then I went up to the Bronx for the, uh, you know, for the celebration there as well. And, was able to see um, Captain Hunt uh, from 56 truck. And I got a picture with him and with, uh, um, uh, and with uh, Dave Werda, who was the Lieutenant working in, in the engine 56 truck and uh, 48 engine. The first two companies at the twin parks fire, they got a company. They each got the company award um, of the year, along with rescue three, all three of them were for the twin parks fire and just the amazing, amazing and courageous job that, uh, um, that they did at that at that fire, despite uh, despite the loss of life, and you know I had some guests with me as well, and um, I had I had somebody go with me last year who brought his son, and this year he brought his son again. Uh, my friend Kurt Isaacson from Florida brought his son last year, and then again this year, and then uh, Coley Moore brought his son this year to see how the FDNY celebrates. Uh, our people on on medal day right we gave out somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 medals and you know yeah there, there's there's one with each of each of us with our sons so there's myself there's there's kurt um and and the rest of the gang there which you know his son trevor my son justin uh corley moore and his son his son jack um jack just he's only a little bit in that picture you see there but he's uh he's a new firefighter in oklahoma city um uh, Corley Moore is a battalion chief in, in Moore City. It's not, they didn't name it after him, just a coincidence. And Kurt is a mm -hmm. battalion chief in uh, Scambia County, uh, Florida. So they, they were able to enjoy enjoy um, seeing another part of the FDNY and how important that is. And speaking about the FD, so at Metal Day, one other point, we, this is a good time. We'll talk about Chief Ferran. Um, 
So he's on his way into retirement. And um, he basically passed the baton at the uh, at Metal Day when he got up and spoke. And you talk about like um, you talk about a, a guy who always knows the right thing to do. In my entire career, I met him as a very young lieutenant. And he has been a mentor to me throughout. No matter where I was working, he called me up. Hey, how would you handle this situation? And making sure that I always thought about all the other options. Mm. And he was always covering covering that to me to make sure that, that I was the best that I can be, that I was looking at it from all angles. And he got up, and I, I think I sent a picture of him, uh, one guy with the microphone in his hand, when he, there he is. As he's just up there, as humble as can be, Telling everybody how much is he, how much he loves them, and how uh, appreciates the work they did. I mean, he's just, you don't. He's he's as good as they get as a as a division commander for someone that you want to work with. Steady hand, loyal to his people, incredibly knowledgeable. You think about leadership. I mean, he's he's certainly um, right up there. He's a presence at, at too, top. man. When you. Yeah. Even for even for us, when we used to go up to him and see him at, at a job or something like that, he's a presence when you when you see him too. You know, he's just got that look, like he's seen it all and been there and done that, and because yep. he has, <laughs> tells a great fire story, bro. Loves to tell story. I've been trying to get him on the show, but says, uh, he would be great. To, he, he tells so, so many humble. great. He would be great to be on the show. Yeah, he would. When I was in the four six, I would see him. I know he's working, and I loved knowing he was working. I knew I had a very competent um, safety net coming if stuff started to get really out of hand. And um, I would see him, he would show up and he'd be lurking around. He wouldn't come up right away. I'd see him out of the corner of my eye and he would do a whole size up. He would do his 360, whatever it is that he wanted to do beforehand. And then he'd come. And if I was roving around, I, I, I had a hard time staying still in front of the building. I like to go, um, you know, check out things myself as well. And he'd be like, you got to stay still. Um, and then he'd come in and he would already have, he would have a really good um, handle of what's going on. Just a, yeah. a cool, cool. He doesn't hand say much and, either, right? I mean, and he doesn't no, really he say would, much. So, yeah. So he would let you run the fire. And that's what I love that. Cause I was like, it's my fire. I didn't like when someone took over my fires. So um, when I get there later on, that was something I always took when I was a deputy and, and now as a staff chief. Like if you're running the fire, I'm not coming here to take over to take over command. I'm in command, but that doesn't mean I have to be running. I don't have to be the guy talking on the radio. That makes no sense. And I, I'll use the Twin Parks example. Jeff Fascinelli was doing an amazing job, with, and the other chiefs and, and people that were running that fire. I didn't get in there and start talking on the radio and start messing up what they were doing. I came in and supported the operation. Otherwise, I would have just made it worse. They were doing such a good job. If you can't improve on it, then just then just you know find your place and, and make it make it better, make it safer. Do what it is that, that you need to do to assist the operation in a team operation in a team sport, which you know which we certainly are. But when I drove my brother at the end, like sometimes he worked mutuals with my brother. Love driving him, bro, because we'd be out just waiting for jobs to come in. We'd be buffing. Sometimes we get in before the first two companies. Sounds good, Kev. Let's go. We get in yeah. the first yeah. two did he really do that? I, I swear yeah. to God. We yeah, got he in. did that all the time. Yep. Yeah. Well, we got in one time over in – we happened to be in the Whitestone area. We got in first two. They didn't even force the door yet. I said, come on, let's go out and force the door. He said, no, nah, no, nah, let's not go that far. Let's let them get in. Let them put the door. <laughs> <laughs> but his best saying, bro, he used to say it all the time. And I, I told you, Ruffy, I sent him a shirt. If I guys were getting a little, you know uh, – Panic. I don't want to say panic, but he would say, all right, boys, let's act like we've done this before. He used to say it on the radio all the time. So I sent him that shirt that we have, act like you've done this before. And he called me He called me last week to thank me. Great guy. Great and and he's certainly first. done it before, right? I mean, oh, about, uh, yeah, 103, 112. Uh, yeah, Captain 112. Uh, forget it. And mm-hmm. just his time as a chief, right? I mean, his time yeah. as a deputy. He was yep. in the division oh when God. I was a lieutenant in, yeah. in 324 in the same firehouse. Yep. So okay. just yeah. So, so I, now, I we know how to, now I know how to get on. I'll lean through Chief Lee. Hey, maybe you should go tell some stories on the show. You know what I mean? Yeah. Get him but, when you get you'll get him and Cleehouse maybe on the same. Yeah. Same time. He tells <laughs> such a detailed story too. I love listening to him. You know. Yeah, and and experiences, right? War stories are transferable experiences, and that's the mm-hmm. importance of that, right? So when when these guys talk, Mark Ferran. 
Jack Kleehouse, he'd work in a division when I was in 324. And he'd come in and say stories and, you know, um, be having coffee at one in the morning to, to make sure I didn't, I didn't miss an ounce of what he had to give. Uh, just, just incredible. The experiences that they have and to be able to have them, um, you know, passing them along is just, uh, yeah. is just amazing. That's why so. I say to guys too, don't be afraid to talk to the chief. You know, they get a lot of knowledge. Even if you're a fireman, just sit there and talk to them, especially if you're in the same firehouse with them. You know what I mean? Because yeah, absolutely. Sit there. I see Mike there. DeBuff in the chat. He knows, he knew chief, uh, you know, he certainly knew both of those chiefs. He knew them well, so he would know. Mm -hmm. And I see uh, a shout out to my buddy, uh, Matt Ryback, who's, uh, who says there's no such thing as a free cup of coffee. That was a while ago, but early on. Because I always tell him, he's in my volunteer fire department. And I, we say, let's meet up for coffee in the morning. I tell him, we'll meet up. But as soon as you get there, there's a call. There's no such thing as a free cup of coffee. <laughs> what about firefighter right? Joe Wiz? Joe Wiz, he's there somewhere, right? He's, he's in, in the there. chat. We saw yeah. he, he was asking about the Remembrance Bulletin. Yeah, there he is. He's in the yeah. room, ready for roll call. <laughs> it's good. It's early yeah. enough. He, hey, he's, not, he's not in Betty by yet? <laughs> what was his question, Chief? He asked... Uh, Somebody asked a question about Tank. No, he said to ask Chief Lieb how he came yeah. up with the idea for the Remembrance Bulletin. Yeah, so the origin of the Remembrance Bulletin, that's a good question. Um I'm a student at a fire service. As I've said on every show, um, I read or listen to something fire related every day. Um, and you must know the lessons learned from, you know, from our brothers and sisters that have been killed in the line of duty. And if I go to a firehouse and I say, how that person, wh why is that plaque on the wall? Like you got to know, mm -hmm. especially if you work in the firehouse. Um, and so we came up with the idea of, you know, couple of different people that work with me on this battalion chief john davies um who's in the 2 battalion now just got the spot um was instrumental he's been working with me since he's a captain and um we wanted to make sure that we captured all of these lessons learned before they become lessons lost and um we took all of the books all of the all of the bulletins that we made and we blew them up uh into a bigger version uh half poster size and uh, which is called tabloid size. Um, when we called our reproduction folks, they were like, you mean tabloid size? I'm like, yeah, whatever. And it, so fun fact, on your printer, there's an option for tabloid size. So that's half poster size. Anyway, we blew them up and we distributed them with frames that we had the FDNY Foundation pay for. Um, and we sent them to the firehouses with the idea of that you'll hang them up on the wall and that we remember these lessons. Now, that doesn't cover all of them, right? We've lost you know, uh, 47 members have been lost in the military. So we do one for Memorial Day. We do one for Veterans Day. But, um, you know, and we've had members that were kicked by a horse or some other maybe, uh, you know, hit by a trolley car. So, and a lot of repeat type of deaths as well. Um, a lot of um, cancers. So we, we might do one that highlights the many um, for, for those types. But the idea was to do 100 instances, um, 100 different versions of it. And then we'll we'll go we'll do more as we as we can or as an investigation concludes or, um, or we have relevant lessons. Right. If we don't have a transferable lesson to today, we didn't we didn't highlight it. That doesn't diminish the, the death. But that's how we went with that. And now we've taken that. Um, and I've been working with um, uh, Billy Goldfeder from The Secret List. And we're in the process where we're, we're going to write a book called 30 fires you must know and these are going to be national fires that we discuss and um you know one of the other guys on this show tonight is uh, one of the authors for one of the chapters for that um yeah so really good looking guy he's a he's a decent looking guy <laughs> <laughs> and well, he does not much. have a mustache <laughs> mm. <laughs> big nose <laughs> Crooked. Oh, no, so on, on camera it's not big. <laughs> <laughs> big crooked nose with glasses. I think I might know him. Yeah. So um yeah, so it's um yes, I was you know, the... the idea is to hopefully have that book out by next April. Um and all the proceeds from that book are gonna be donated to uh to four different charities. Beautiful. And uh yeah, so that'll be uh that'll be that'll be good. And basically it's we have an author that writes part of the chapter about this, about it. 
uh, an introduction, then what the author writes, and then a training bulletin. That we're, the, the goal will be to have 10 training tips for each fire. Mm. Uh, and that's and that's the book, but um, which was somewhat born out of the remembrance uh, book and, and bulletins uh, mm. as well. So great um, honor, great honor, Chief. I was I was given the task of doing the Father's Day fire, and I was humbled and uh, just. And he it. and you knocked it out of park. Like you did a great, you get a, did a great job with it. And and one of the interesting, one of the really good things about um, about it is that like you may have learned a lot about. A different fire that we talk about, but you may never have heard it from this person's viewpoint, mm. from wherever they were. They may, you know, some of the fires are, um, are a while ago, so you may not have heard this version from this person who may have been, you know, on the on the hose line, or maybe he was on the roof, or you know, whatever it was. Um, That's it, like half the guys on the be, show when they talk about being at wall bombs, or they talk about being, you know, we've heard about all those jobs, but now all of a sudden you, you got some guy and on the podcast who's talking about that firsthand account of what he did and where he went and what he saw changes everything. Right. Yeah. How many yeah. times have somebody said something we're like, Holy shit, we never knew that. We know we thought we knew everything about that fire or that uh, whatever it was. Right. No, it's exactly. That's why it's so interesting. Yeah. That's exactly right. And you know, it's, yeah, I can't wait for this to be, uh, to be done. It's truly a labor of love. It's going to be, um, it's going to be really good. Um, so, Hey, speaking of books, can we yeah. move into the? Uh, they saved New York. Sure, I know. I know a really handsome guy who wrote the forward for that. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll tell you. You know. So I had the absolute privilege to get an advanced viewing of that book um, because I was asked to write the forward for it. But um, which you know I was honored to do. I, I still. I still keep wondering why the heck I'm even in that book, but that's a, a whole nother, a whole nother topic because truly in a job of legendary people, I mean, the people that are in this book, their stories, their, mm -hmm. just everything. It's just incredible. Um, a pitch is worth a thousand words and Glenn did a great job with the photos. And then, you know, the stories that, that Dan put with them, it just, um, I simply can't wait until I get, um, until I get, until I get my copy, but I got to tell you how I met Glenn is a pretty interesting story. He took a picture in the 1970s of a fire that my brother was at and um, he posted it on Facebook a couple of years ago. And as soon as he did, he was basically, he didn't know who they were. He just posted a bunch of pictures and several people started texting me. Hey, do you know this guy? Uh, at the time I didn't. And then um, they told me, they said, he's got a picture of what, someone who I think is your brother. And I look and I'm like, wow, it is my brother. It was a picture that we hadn't seen. So my brother passed away when he's only 36 years old. Um, so that picture is priceless to myself and to my family. So having that picture, um, which as soon as I reached out to him, he immediately mailed me a copy of the picture on like a, on a, a, a metal, it's, it's, um, it's like etched. And then I told him, I said, I had to put that picture up at my volunteer firehouse where it's, it is today in East Farmingdale Firehouse on, on the, in the stairwell. He sent me another one because he said, you have to have it in your house. What a great guy, man. So, you t yeah, a, a, a great guy doesn't even begin to, um, to, tell, to tell his story and his love for the fire service. I mean, you could, listening to the show, um, for me, I'm like, you could, you could hear how much he loves oh my the God. fire service. How many times yeah. we were almost close to freaking uh... – I'm not crying. You're crying. No, you're you know crying. what I mean? Like, yeah, because it's because the stories are just amazing. It's really just amazing the stories that are that are in that book. And I, I just I can't wait to um, I can't wait to get my copy. I know I got to wait a couple more weeks. I think, but you know I, I'm tired of waiting. I want I want my I, copy. I ordered right. mine. I, I ordered, ordered mine. Start shipping. You know, and I'm saying that, and I've got to see the digital version of it already. So I can't I can't wait. Um, I did get know, that, that, that version too, but I didn't read, I didn't read anything. Yeah, I kept, I couldn't help it. I kept, you reading. know what it is, Riffy. We paid for us. Somebody's waiting to get it. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, on the cuff, like, like on the, the uh, uh, you know what I mean? Like this, you know, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh hey, I see the guys from New Haven, Iran. A little shout out for those brothers. Fairfax 38 is watching. Um, some of my friends there watching the show. Uh, appreciate it. Hey, Fairfax. Chief, Hank, Hank asked uh, okay, cool. what were you going to say about Fairfax? 
Fairfax in the house. That's where we knew what's his oh. name was from. Uh, the one who was married to Terry Berry. Uh, shit, what the hell was his name? Two doors down. He was a Fairfax uh, in the Fairfax Ready? rescue. No, no. Uh, Snapper. They used to call him Snapper, Fairfax. Just retired. All right, uh, I'm done with my useless information. Go ahead, Chief. I'm sorry. Hank, uh, <laughs> Hank was asking just to, because we talked about the uh, the new life saving rope. He was just asking. I was I, I texted at the tank what it what what the rope was made of, but he was asking what it what the rope was and the size and all that stuff. If you had any of that information, yeah. So it's hundred it's one hundred and fifty feet, and we're switching to uh, a current mental life saving rope. So KLSR. That's uh, that's what the new one is. So it's um, it's stronger, more flexible. So that's that's kind of what we're doing um, with that. So it'll be it's half inch. Um, what is it? Huh. It's half inch. What is it? Nine sixteenths or whatever the hell. It was. Yeah, nine six. I'm, it's nine sixteenths. I'm pretty sure it's the same. Um, yeah, so uh, we should be good with that. It's a good. It's a good rope. It passed, everybody seemed to uh, to like it when they were doing the tests. As you guys know, that was a while ago now. But it has the lowering. Dis, it has the lowering device with it already, so you don't have to. You just have to clip it into. Yeah. Loop, right? No turns. No nothing. We we can get rid of Deputy Tony. Hits a home run far away. That's done. Yeah, so you'll never. So listen, you'll go to your grave memorizing that, right? Yeah. Um, but hey, let's switch gears. How about um, my man Tank? You got a. Uh, you probably have a video of uh, of John of Gold, right? You probably have two of them. So Absolutely. I know. I know he's in the chat. I see him in there. But what is he under? Um, huh? What's he under in the chat? I think he. I think that's. I just saw that he said. Uh, he said hello. That he's. Uh, let me see. Uh, um, but I'm pretty sure he's under he's under John of Gold. Yeah. Oh, yep, I see um, him. So he said, uh, so I met this kid. I met this guy, right? He's um he's friends with, with Joe Loftus, one of the members that I said did well on the deputy <clears> test. <throat> he met him when he was a captain in 16 truck in uh in Manhattan and became friends with him. So he arranged to go. He now Jonah now lives in New Jersey. So Joe Loftus arranged to go pick him up at his home. He took the family's van and brought him to the FDNY Fire Academy. The day he was there, it just so happened to be the MSOC conference going on and the Leary Firefighter Foundation uh, event. And the Leary Foundation, so Dennis Leary, there, there was um, a, a bunch of retired football players, uh, some other um, celebrities that some I knew, some I didn't know. They're from different, from The Wire and some um, some other shows. Uh, Rachel Ray was there. Um, and um, I'm in there and I'm talking to some of the, I'm talking to some of the people I'm talking to Joe Loftus. And then uh, the kid calls him over and uh, he says to, to Joe Loftus, he goes, that's chief lead. That's chief lead. And he says, uh, I want to meet him. You know, Joe says, you want to meet him? He says, yeah. So I go over, I take some pictures with him. I shake his hand. So at the end of the day, Joe Loftus sends me a video um, of him when he asks him, well, let's just play the video. It's easy to just play the video and see. Um, it was it was pretty cool. Here we go. Interview with Jonah Gold right here. So we're gonna ask him a few questions about uh, the Rock. What was your favorite part of the Rock? Seeing all the froies getting yelled at and stuff like that. All right, did you meet anyone famous? Anyone? Chief Lee. <laughs> yes, you met Chief Lee. What yeah. about famous people? Well, oh, he's famous. Rachel yes. Ray. Rachel Ray, yep. Brian Williams. Brian Williams, yep. And the girl from Law and Order. Girl from Law and Order. Yes. Cool. All and right, my are... man. Good day, huh? Yes. And what else? We saw NYPD, right? NYPD. They had their big truck. Yeah. They tried to convert you, right, and give you their hat. No, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. I love it, buddy. All right, my man. Love you, man. <laughs> love you too, Jonah. Thank you. All right, pal. Bye. -bye. What a cool kid. What oh, a fucking you. awesome kid. Yeah. So that's not the end of his day, right? So he's taking him in different places. So they finish inside with us, right? And then he's, Joe Loftus sends me this other video where 156 is at the fire academy and sees, this, and sees Jonah. And Jonah's waving to them. And um, if you want to play the video, I'll talk while it's, while it's playing. Um. All right. Thank you, guys. Watch the lieutenant. Cool, Give him no? his pause. Oh man. 
Oh wow! Thank you. Now you can wave them on. So they're going back to Brooklyn now. Oh. And then you see the thing, the highway truck they call. What they give you? Did he give you lieutenant pins? Yeah. Oh my God! Flip that over. He gave you his. He gave you his lieutenant yeah. badge. <laughs> yeah. The highway, baby. That's the brothers, man. You get your it gives me goosebumps, bro. That's right, and it's you know, it's just it's 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 so many of these little these little things, right? That are the FDNY way. I say it all the time. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't have to be the FDNY, right? These are things that we do. The way we can impact people just by being nice to them, just by understanding. I tell, say it all the time. The FDNY on the back of your coat means so much more. And it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be the FDNY. Wherever you're from, right, it, it matters. It matters greatly. Be worthy of the gear and the uniform that you wear every single day and know that people are always watching you. They're always looking to see what you're doing. And there's so many people that are our friends that look up to us and be worthy of your profession, whether your career or volunteer, it doesn't matter. That costs nothing. And that, that, that act, that act, right. That says it all, right. Um, One fifty six, just stopping, right. The officer jumps out spur in a moment. That's just ingrained in what we do and who we are as people. And we should never lose that and lose sight of that because, boy, we are blessed to be in this profession where people um, of the public hold us in very high regard. <clears throat> Don't ever do anything to, to lose that, right? Because that has been earned on the backs of many giants in the fire service, you know, in the FDNY, outside of the FDNY, everybody. Um, Don't lose that. He gave him the lieutenant's bars that he was that he would wear he on just, his uniform. He, he just got asked him. He just got him from uh, the quartermaster. Like the quartermaster, and he gave it to him right yeah. out of the bag. Which you know, it, it's it's the little things that that matter so so um, so so no, much. I like it. You know, somebody somebody so, said, uh, "Who is it?" Beecher, James Beecher said, "A field promotion." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a whole YouTube video that that uh, Joe Loftus made. If you, I think I sent Tank the that, that'll be good to put in the notes. But just you know, be worthy, be worthy of what we do because so many people are looking to us. Uh, people hold us as as role models. I mean, it's just you know, be and that that is incredibly humbling. You said I got goosebumps and immediately said, you know, Jonah watches this show. Well. If he watches this show, well, we're going to do a little segment on him um, because thank you, Jonah. Thank you for loving the FDNY, for loving the fire service, and for taking give good it, care of my good friend, Joe Loftus, along the way. And giving the PD hat back. Yeah, good That's job. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't and, let him convert you, kid. Yeah, and he did it with, with style and grace. No thank you. Right? <laughs> good job, man. Yeah. You ever, have, you ever see a... Uh, an occupation where the guys love what they do as much as this, whether you're volunteer or you're paid. I've never seen an occupation where guys just love what they do like this. No, Most I definitely. Yeah. I, I've never seen, I've never seen it. Um, another profession like this. That's why I, you know, uh, I thank God. I think, you know, my lucky stars that, that I have the privilege to be a firefighter. I mean, it's just uh, I couldn't I couldn't dream of doing anything else uh, uh, for a career and, and or even in the volunteers. I, I love it. I love the people that are in that I work with that are in the FDNY. I love the people that are in my volunteer department and and even the folks that aren't in my volunteer department. I see them, you know, as like Paul Mazza that I saw last night, who I'm, I'm sure he's in the chat uh, in the chat tonight. The guys in the exchange ambulances of the isolate that are in the the chat. I think I saw that the 
um, the Islip uh, airport firefighters, I think, are in I there as well. That, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, so like that's what matters, right? I mean, yeah. because we care, because we love our profession, we love what we do, and we're dedicated to the craft to be better. And that's. Did you, did you hear the girl? The girl who took the video of the uh, life saving rope, right? She would before she even saw them going down on the rope she saw the guys up on the you know the fire was venting out the window and the guy pops out of he's in that room right he comes out onto the fire escape it looked like a boss i couldn't even tell but she she says something i don't know exactly what it was but i remember when i was watching it it was something like she's like oh my god these guys are like re true heroes or something to that effect you remember what she says hank exactly no, i don't even know no, no, you don't have to. Yeah, just I know she says something like that, which just stuck out to me. Like, again, they don't a lot of people don't always see it, you know, like uh, maybe in that area there, maybe they don't see the fire department too often, you know. So for her to see. To, and that was another thing, too. Like I was talking to my cousin. You're on video, man. You think you're in the back, like hanging over on a rope, like nobody's going to video you. Nobody's going to know what you did, bro. <laughs> You know? that, that's why you are Jesus... always someone is always watching and likely videoing you as well right and that's why you said always be a professional because you're wearing our colors that that was a big thing with chief steve that's the one tip that he gave always act like a professional because you're representing every guy on the job yeah absolutely timmy klett says it right in the chat right the job is a way of life a state of mind not an occupation greatest job in the world and I'll add to that volunteer or career. It doesn't matter, right? We're we're all in this together. We all have have a similar love for what we yeah. do. And they do it for free. You kidding me? Yeah. I mean, come on. Could you imagine that another caller? Yeah, you're a ditch digger. Hey, do me a favor. I want you to do that for free next week, all week, all right? <laughs> like, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, absolutely. 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 And, and you can never, they can never, I said this in the past before, they can never do enough. They're trying to get in our boxes, one to go to fire. Like, you ever hear the sanitation guys say, uh, give me one more say. block. Give me one more block, man. Give me, give me five more pails. Let me do some more, let me do some more garbage. <laughs> no, but yeah, so it's to. funny. We're about I, was having, I was having a conversation with, um, with one of my good friends the other day, and uh, he's getting up there in age and he's getting close to retirement. I keep telling him, I'm like, the recovery to get better, right? You know, to after after a tough night, right? He's in a busy company in the city, and you know, it takes it takes a couple of days to recover. And I say, sometime at some point, you're going to have to retire because I've come. Here's the conclusion I've come to: I have 31 years in the FDNY, 40 years in my volunteer fire department. I could live for a, to be 120, and I will never satisfy my appetite to go to fires. Mm. I never will. Um, but I think in being on podcasts, being with, around you guys, going to the different shows, being engaged with the other stuff, going to retiree events, going to all the other stuff. You could recreate the kitchen. You could recreate some of the other stuff, the brother and sisterhood, but there's, there's no recreating. There's, there's no way to fill the void of getting on a fire truck adrenaline, and the officer banging the window that you're going to a job nope. and you got the nozzle and it's out three windows in the front. There's just, you simply can't make up for that. No. Turn the and, corner, right? You turn the yeah. corner and you just see it far out the window and you're like, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, man, oh, man. And there's just no way, there's just no way that you're going to be able to um, make up for that, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. That's the biggest, I think, you know, from talking to guys that have retired and girls that have retired, that to make up for that is, um, it's, it is the challenge, right? And, um but I was burning leaves point, today. Does that point, count? You got to land the plane, which is what I was telling my buddy. At some point, you know, you, you got to be healthy enough when you retire to do the things you want to do. Right. You know what? That's a good segue, Hank. Uh, to Hank. I called him Hank again. I think you did before. Frank. Too. Frank. That happens. Whatever. Frank. Uh, let's play the uh, health and safety uh, tip of the evening because let, let's get on that before. Because okay. uh, Chief Lee did a great segue there. Uh, here we go. The First Responders Center for Excellence is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to protecting the lives and livelihoods of first responders. Their education and research initiatives aim to bring greater awareness and understanding to the challenges to the health, safety, and well-being of firefighters, EMS personnel, and other first responders, too. They are an affiliate of the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation. 
And this is what I'm going to say. I'm not going to read off the list tonight. This is what I propose to everybody, and I highly recommend it. Act like you are a hypochondriac, bro, and listen to your body. Because if you <clears throat> early detection, right? We talked about this chiefly, is key in all of this. Nobody wants to work. Everybody wants to work until they're old. That's great. But like the chief just said, sometimes you got to bring it in for a landing and you want to enjoy whatever time you have with, the, with your family. So there are so many things that are out there today. Like we have Rob Brown, right? You have all these tests that you can go for, the calcification tests and all this. They're available. Don't wait. Listen to your body. If something feels off, get it checked out. You know, like act like you're a hypochondriac. Oh, like I tell Lou all the time, like something goes wrong. Oh, I think I have cancer. Let me go get that checked out. You know, it doesn't have to be to that extreme, but get yourself looked at because I say it all the time. My brother, the knucklehead, all he would have had to do is go for one of those carotid artery tests or calcification tests, and he would still be here today. He thought he, he would go once a year to a stress test, or it wasn't even a thallium stress test. He would be fine. Well, guess what? He's dead before he's 60. So, my father dead before he's 57. So get yourself checked out. All the fires that we go to today and the lifestyle that we live, what do you think that jumping up and down in the middle of the night, you know, the bell goes off, your heart beats out of your chest, that's not going to have an effect on you? Or the food that we eat in the firehouse, you're fooling yourself. You got to get yourself checked out before it's too late. Early detection, early detection, early detection. Yeah, and and thank you for that. And you're 100% right. And... Um... Uh, Detect Together is a non-for-profit that talks about uh, early detection, and they, they specifically talk about the two-week rule. So the FDNY has a long-term partnership with them. We've created videos with them. Um, <clears throat> and stuff. In fact, feature, one featuring Kim McDonough, the widow of Ed McDonough. Um, she also wrote something for our Reduce Your Risk publication. And so when something doesn't feel right, and it's more than two weeks, you need to get it checked out. So that's the tech together in their two week rule. And we trained all of our people during during education day um, on on that a couple of years ago. Um, and, and yeah, you're, you're so right. It, it, the, the early detection matters so much more information. You could also get and, and have links to some of those videos on the first responder Center for Excellence website. You could go to the tech together's website. They both have information on there. And um if it's good with you, I'm gonna I'm gonna segue into um, uh, the fact that uh, this this Friday is the five year anniversary of of Chief Spatafora's passing away, um, who was only 62 years old, and um, you know we asked him to write uh, an article for our Reduce Your Risk publication, and uh, he immediately said anything for the anything for the brothers, and his last publication, his last article he wrote, appeared. And there he is, appeared in our Reduce Your Risk publication, which we released five years ago this Saturday wow. coming up. So you could see his article in there um, and you could see this is the tip from training that we put out. Um, and later on, we'll give out a QR code to um, uh, also to my new link tree, which has a lot of links to some of these different uh, videos and stuff as well that we have them there. Um, but um yeah, it matters. Uh, oh, there you go. There you go. On Father's Day, my son, uh, my son was nice enough to introduce me to this, this uh, pretty cool app, Linktree, and he he set it all up for me. He's like, "Look, I put some of the stuff that you've done on this." I'm like, "This is pretty cool," and then I went wild. So uh, I'm continuing to update it. There's all sorts of good resources on there as well, um, besides a good way to uh, to connect. Uh, with me if you're interested in doing so. But, um, you know, Chief Spatafora's article, Kim McDonough, Ed McDonough's widow, writes an article in there. And um, we just built on a decades-long commitment to the FDNY to the health and wellness of of our members. So that Reduce Your Risk publication is definitely worthy. And the EMS um, most recent class just graduated on Wednesday. And the a relative of, of Ed McDonough um, graduated that class and the FDNY posted about that. Um, and so just, uh, you know, a shout out to the McDonough family and, and what they've done and certainly what they mean to me. I was good friends with, uh, with Ed McDonough. So um, 
And then how about safety week? Uh, so this we're in safety week now. And um, nationally, the topic is lithium ion batteries. But the FDNY had a symposium last year. And we've experienced quite a few fires involving lithium ion batteries. And we're um, involved with changing the codes and some of the other stuff that needs to be done to best protect the visitors and residents of New York City and firefighters, by the way, right? Because firefighters are not immune to injuries. But the FDNY Safety Week this year is um, suicide and suicide prevention um, and awareness. And, um, you know, incredibly important topic. And kudos to the FDNY and, you know, Joe Malvasio, who's who's one of our um, all-star civilians, did a good job on that. Drew Kane, the head of our counseling unit. And a lot of the members of the safety command who've been instrumental in making safety week, um, uh, you know, what it is, what it will be this week, which is a difficult topic for any one of us to talk about. But, um, you know, we understand that we can save we can save people by talking about it because we know that, um, you know, you can't unsee what you've seen. We know it's OK to not be OK. We also know that it's not only what we're seeing and doing on scene, it's, it's, it's stuff off the scene. It's at home. It's all the other stressors that we have in life that can cumulatively um, make you need to be, you know, to get help. And, I, and I'm very appreciative. I know you've had multiple um, shows on the topic and you've had, you know, Ron Zoni and Mike Milner and, and people who are really making a difference <clears throat> in those fields. Uh, on the show, but man, we you got to get help. We got if you need it, and we have to preload our firefighters early on in their career. We got to preload them so they know how to deal with this. Right? We teach you how to be an engine firefighter, how to be a truck firefighter, how to use our tools. We equip you with that knowledge, but we don't equip you with the knowledge that you may need to handle the stresses in life that come our way of of being a firefighter on and off the fire ground. There's so many different things. That that impact that that we that we certainly um, that we we need to do better and educate our people in in that way. And uh, somebody outside the FDNY who's a big advocate for that, uh, my friend Dina Alley, who is a uh, battalion chief in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, is in the process of writing a book um, on that topic, and she is definitely a leader in that in that space. And she just asked me uh, two days ago if I would write the forward for that. And I just got the manuscript for the book. And um, I'm only a couple of pages in. But I know I, by knowing her, knowing her knowledge, the conversations I've had, it's going to be an excellent book. And I'm excited. I'm excited for that, um, for that project as well. So there's so many people out there doing good things for us. When we talk about the research, whether it's mental health, whether it's cancer, whether it's any, you know, whatever it is, right? Even... You know, so um, it, there's a there's a fairly new publication out there, Crackle Magazine, um, and like even even the the most recent cover of that, right, is a non firefighter. They put a, re a researcher, um, Sarah Jenke, is on the cover of that, right, and we had her at the FDNY a couple of years ago. She was eight months pregnant. She lives in Kansas City, and I told her, I said, you have to come here. And um, and do the presentation because she is such a leader in the research that she does. And she's also able to deliver it to firefighters in a way that few people are able to do. So certainly a shout out to Dr. Sarah Jenke and the work that she's been doing. Most firefighters have no idea who, who the researchers are or who these and this researcher is. But I can tell you that you have certainly benefited from what they do for our profession to make sure that we can be as healthy and safe as possible so that so that Krubs, you're not losing your brother when he's young. You're not losing your dad when he's young. We're not losing our firefighters when they're young. Um, as a captain, when I was a captain, a firefighter that I worked with when I was a lieutenant, I got a phone call. They didn't know where he was. And he wound up, he killed himself. And I was one of the people who knew him best. And I knew nothing. I knew nothing I did not know it was coming. I didn't see warning signs. There was nothing. So the fact that you guys talk about that, that you bring that up, they're hard topics to talk about. All these are hard topics to talk about. 
but you guys confront them head on and have those serious programs. And um, I love you guys for lots of reasons, but that's, that's a big one right there that you guys can have fun, but you also know when it's time to be serious and talk about the serious topics that are impacting firefighter health and safety. I just wanted to jump off one of the things that you said really quick. You can't unsee what you've seen, right? That being said, it's not embarrassing to see somebody, to talk to somebody. And I'm going to give you an example. I was just talking to my therapist two days, two days yesterday. And she said that a good friend of hers, her husband is a military guy. He was a uh, medic in Afghanistan. And then he became an FDNY firefighter. He says by far, he has seen more disturbing things on the FDNY than he saw as a medic in Afghanistan. So that tells you the stuff that you see. And once you see it, you cannot unsee it. You need a place to package it and you need a place to file it. And there's nothing wrong with talking to somebody about it. That's what I got to say about that. Well, we had Gary in our place, Gary Solitani. No, yeah. He, matter of fact, he, he was going home. He says, I'm, I'm coming in tonight. I'm bringing the meals. What does anybody want? Anybody want anything in particular? No, no, Gary. Went home. Took a uh, a rifle, shot himself in the chest. So, like you said, Chief, the only thing you can do is tell people to get out. If you're feeling these things, get out and talk to somebody. There is help, and there are more of us than you think. So, don't be embarrassed by it. There's so much help out there. There's so many people. You, no one fights alone, right? And we don't leave anybody on a fire floor. You know, that is, you know, the the counseling services in the FDNY and and elsewhere. There's so much, there's so many resources out there. Coops, you hit it on the head. You, if you need the help, you got to ask for the help because, you know, we're in the greatest profession on the planet and we can overcome anything together. Yeah. And that, you know what? I was telling the guys beforehand, I, I won't mention their names. I've been going back in emails with a guy who was contemplating suicide. And it, it, dude, if it's me you get to talk to, Coob's a podcast at gmail, Coob's podcast at gmail.com. I'll start you on the, I'll point you in the right direction. So, you know, whoever you need to talk to, I don't care. I've been through it before, still go through it. So don't hesitate to talk to anybody. Yeah. What else Absolutely. we got, Chief? Before we, we got a lot the, of, we got some questions here. Yeah, but let's get into all the questions. Let me ask my two that they sent because I'm the one who said it last week to send it to my email. So I'm going to say it right now. Uh, volunteer for a small town in Connecticut uh, from 80 to 90. Kevin Lowe, I've been watching uh, since the beginning. Great show and always getting better with every show and Kevin's crazy ideas, a.k.a. Pizza Cutter. Aha, uh -huh. I worked the Pizza Cutter. In. Question one, has the FDNY thought of working with the main video guys like the Majestrium and Skylar Fire for help during big alarms because sometimes they need to see things that you and your chiefs cannot see. Hmm. That's a great question. So um, um, the the video, the uh, the still image that you used for tonight's promo for the show, that's from yeah. Skyler. Okay. And I'm glad you said I'm glad you said that because every once in a while I forget who I got it from. But um, those guys are fantastic. This and every time I try and mention them, I always miss one. So collectively, they're fantastic. And I personally work with all of any and all of them that want to help out when they have videos and they have um, uh, stuff that's relevant. So they will send it to me, especially as a safety chief, uh, and we'll evaluate it. And, and we won't put it out. Maybe we'll put a tip from training out on something because I'm, you know. I'm not ever looking to embarrass our people. I just want to make our people as best as they can be, right? Um, make them make them hard to injure and impossible to kill, right? If we do that, we're doing a good job. If we we leave the we leave the bond with five, we come back with five, we're doing good, mm. right? Um, and so they are very helpful with that. So we we work with them. Um, I work with them quite often. I'm friends with them. I love seeing them. I love seeing them at fires. They love the they love the FDNY and the fire service the way we love it, right? And you see their reaction, and I'll, I'll always, you know, um, you know, uh, JJ, right, the magistrate, when he when he videotaped the um, the the backdraft on uh, Queens Boulevard, Queens Boulevard, yeah, right, yeah. several years ago, which you used on your your intro, this one? 
Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I still get goosebumps when I hear that because um that reaction is from somebody who in the moment of the time he demonstrated like <clears throat> he loves us and he was he was he thought he was seeing us get injured or possibly killed. And that was his emotion coming out. He he, he doesn't want to get a video of us um, getting injured. He loves he loves us. So um, and, and I, I think it's great. I think we should watch their videos as as, um, as much as we can because they they're able to make a couple of shekels on on YouTube from it. And I think that's great. So I support them uh, however however I can. And I appreciate the videos because those videos are transferable experiences. If you're watching a video and 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 especially if you have an experienced instructor or an experienced firefighter who's telling you what's going on in the video. As a chief, I used to go around and I would screen mirror my phone onto the onto the local company's TVs and I would use videos online. This was the citizen wasn't around back then, or I would pictures that I had from fires. Um, and I'd go to quarters, I'd go there, you know, bringing information that they may not, they, they don't know, they weren't at the fire, right? So I want to transfer that experience to them. So those guys are great. And um, he could have done uh, it in a lower pitch, though, you know. Well, yeah. So, but, <laughs> and it's, yeah, not there forever. But, I appreciate you know, that he was concerned, but he could have been like, really holy but shit. He had a reaction that to yeah. me demonstrated his love for us. That comes from Kevin Pierce. And he says also, he says that. He heard that you were a big YouTube watcher. So, who said you, that? <laughs> this guy, Kevin Pierce, the guy who wrote that question. He says, "I heard oh. Chief Lee was a big YouTube watcher." Who is it? Yeah, who is yeah, it? This, right? yeah this is, you can learn a lot. You can learn learn yeah. a lot from fire videos. That's for sure. All right, Tank, you got a whole plethora of questions in there. Bro. I do. Let's you and, had two. Did you do both of them, and I just missed it. Well, that was if he said no. I, there was a follow up question. Oh, I said right. he uses them so. Okay, so yeah, I got like 10 potential questions started. We're going to start with the ones that threw a few shekels in the Super Chat oh, to us. We like those guys. Yeah. It's always good. Start with them. So early on in the show, Tyler Durden. Durden. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Dirty. Hey, Chief. Men, what is or can be done about these e-bikes? Granted, they're good for business, but are going to burn out the city. Yeah, so... Huh. Hmm. Whew. So we've been dealing. So and by we, I say at the we know that we've been tracking lithium ion battery fires in New York City for uh, for several years now, right? I have we have tips from training uh, that are a couple of years old from that. So we've been tracking this for a while, um, and we've been involved with with educating the public. It's it's only more recently that uh, that it's gotten the um, the media attention and the attention that it deserves. So. I think you're going to see some some more regulations out of it right now. Uh, the city and the fire department recently announced an initiative to uh, go on an education enforcement um, campaign, uh, investigate complaints thoroughly, all those type of things. But you're going to see people that are going to say, "I'm not living above um, above a, a place that sells or repairs e-bikes," um, and we've already seen. Um, homeowners associations that have set a that are banning them but you know um it, it's the problem is these are such a good way to get around the city um that it's that it's very it's a it's a very difficult um mm -hmm. a very difficult problem the there's only one reason i don't own an e-bike and i don't live in new york city but the only reason i don't own an e-bike is because i don't have a place that i can store it away from my house that I don't have to worry about it getting stolen because I wouldn't charge an e-bike or own an e-bike that I got to charge inside my house where, where my family and myself are, whether I'm a, a awake or, or asleep, but that's my personal opinion. Now the, the, the fire department's message has been um, make sure that you're using a battery that's appropriate for the e-bike. Um, make sure that you're not charging it when you're sleeping, make sure that you're not putting it in a path of egress from from your dwelling, uh, make sure that the batteries are, you know, UL approved. Um, How many don't e you think are out there? Oh my God. You know, you know what the problem is? I'm just going to say it, Rafi. When I go down into Jackson Heights, specifically Junction 
and Roosevelt. First of all, these street vendors, they probably have no license to sell, nothing. These e-bikes are lined up for blocks outside and they're selling them. Now I know for goddamn sure these batteries aren't UL tested or UL certified. So there's a problem. You, you just can't even wrap your hand and your head around getting these things. Is there that many being sold? Like I don't rough. I'm telling you. There are on there. They're, they're everywhere. They are everywhere. They're being sold for blocks and blocks outside on, on the curb. What are they like? Those are like the things that we see like when we go away where you rent like the them. Little like little scooters? Yeah. yeah that's, some of them are scooters, but some of them are actually bikes, you know? Well, because even, even like the city bikes now have options that are um, that are e-bikes. And out on Long Island, they have the, you know, the, um, the e-bikes. I, I just saw a rack the other day. I was out for a walk and they had e-bikes on them. They're, they're the Beth Page Federal Credit Union sponsors them. So they, yeah, you're they right, have them. Right? I went into PC Richards the other day, um, and you know that's the electronics store nearby, and they're selling. They're on the bike was on sale; it was under a thousand dollars, and it's a beautiful bike. Um, so people are using these, and um, it's an easy way to get around. So you could live on Long Island. You could you need to get a permit to park at the train station. So now I don't need the permit. I leave my car at home, take the e bike to the to the train station. Put the bike on the train, go to wherever I gotta go, bike to work, and I'm I'll make up that cost for the thousand dollars in no time. Yep. So it's definitely a it's definitely um, a big problem for the fire service. At least there's a lot of stuff out there on how we could best protect ourselves, but we um, and what we should be doing. And if you want, I'll give you a couple of the, a couple of the pointers on on what we should be doing that are from our um, our document uh, hazmat twenty with his lithium ion batteries. That um, Joe Loftus, who we mentioned earlier, um, among um, among others, John Cassidy, some of our hazmat um, gurus um, put it together. Basically, we don't want to bring a, an e-bike into an elevator ever. Um, we don't want to handle them with our hands. Um, we want to have a shovel or something. We want to put them into either a pail or a bucket of water. Um, if there's none available, put them into a, a sink or a tub. Um, never throw them out a window. So if we need to remove it from, say, a second floor, you have it in a bucket of water, lower the bucket down. Um, make sure that you're using your SCBA, another reason to make sure you have all your PPE on at all times. Um, and then make sure that um, uh, that before you overhaul and drop the sheetrock in the whole room, that we're accounting for the batteries for all the single cells, right? So the cells in these e-mobility devices, right? That's, what, that's what's the big problem right now. So we could talk about cars as well. Um, but in New York City, we haven't seen that to be a big problem yet. I know, I know there's been car fires around, you know, around the country. But um, basically, a e-mobility device has 100 or so batteries that look like that look like AA batteries. They're put into a plastic casing, and they're put all together. And when one goes into thermal runaway. Uh, we get propagation to the next one and so on. And next thing you know, we have several batteries that are on fire and eventually the energy from it blows them apart. And if it's in a confined space, we're seeing this happen in only a couple of seconds. UL, I think, demonstrated that in 1.2 seconds, the, the window was racked in a video that they put out there. So there's a, a, there's a lot of people that, you know, that are doing work on this, but you know, we got to make sure we count. So that blows it apart. We got to count for all these batteries. So a spent battery is not a dangerous battery, but we don't know which ones are, which ones aren't. So we want to get all those batteries, put them into the bucket in New York City. We overpack them and get them outside. But, you know, at a minimum, we got to make sure we're getting them out of the structure. If you're in a rural area, there's, there's places that you can pro probably bring them, but at least get it out of the structure. So we're not worried about, um, you know, a reignition. Uh, inside inside the structure with them, but those are the the very basic down and dirty tactics. Our mm -hmm. initial tactics are the our initial attack tactics are the same. Get in there, get after it, put water on a fire, then collect them all safely, get them outside, making sure we're putting them in water while they're inside, not touching them. All those type of things. The cars are are basically a bike with a heck of a lot more of these um, battery cells in there. The challenge is getting to the battery without piercing it, without having, you know, so if we have something where we're piercing the battery and it's not a failed battery, we, we run the risk of failing that 
of potentially making the situation worse. So um, there's been no foam proven to be to be better. Um, we just need to get the, the challenges getting the water where we need it to be to control the fire and then getting the, the batteries where we need to, to be. The long-term answer for cars is not going to be submerging cars in water because eventually when every car is an electric car, what are we going to, you know, what are we going to be, where are we going to keep these? What are we going to, every car is going to be totaled because it has a battery fire or a battery, you know, something related to that. So eventually firefighters will find the solution for this. And the, um, the manufacturers, right. People who are trying to make money in this arena, they know people aren't going to want to buy their product. Yeah, They got to figure that part out soon. It's like me. I, I'm not buying one because I don't, I'm worried about, Correct. about the health of my family. So, it's going to be more toxic to the uh, the environment than those batteries than fossil fuels. So you're, you're kidding you. All right, Tank, let's go. Go to the next one, kiddo. Oh. Next one. I have a question. XAC Lockhart. I have a question. With the concerns of carcinogens and structural PPE, what type of PPE does the chief recommend for non-fire emergencies to reduce this exposure? as an alternative to structural PPE? Um, yeah, so be respectful. There is there is no, there currently is no bunker gear that's superior to protecting us from fire uh, and from everything related to a fire. So we should be using, continuing to use this while the uh, while people find, while the researchers and, and these companies find better alternatives. However, <clears throat> and it's a big however, if we are on a non-structural emergency, if we don't have a threat of fire, we should not be wearing, we should not be wearing our structural firefighting gear. If we are going out to the store to buy the meal, we should not be wearing structural firefighting gear. If we are going on a medical emergency, we should not be wearing Structural firefighting gear. You see the theme there? If we're out checking fire hydrants, we should not be wearing, whatever we're doing, we should not be wearing firefighting gear. However, that may mean, right, in the wintertime, when you might be cold, when we put our, so we need to have coats that, that keep us warm, right? Because the bunker coat, the bunker coat keeps us warm. But we have to be more respectful of the gear that we have and understand that our gear, right, has PFAS chemicals in them We're, and they're working nfpa the iff there's lots of different people through the standards and through what the iff has been doing that are looking into this to make it to make it better but there is no safer alternative um how do you combat that well be respectful of the gear make sure that you're not wearing your gear on non-structural responses right on non-fire responses make sure that you wash your hands following every single run that you touch your gear Make sure that if your children, if you're taking pictures and you, you want your children in it, um, get a black blanket and place them on that first before you put them on your gear. It just minimizes the potential for contamination for your for your for any of your family members. Chief, how? Remember, at the end of your tour, at the end of your tour, or then you if you're a career firefighter, shower before you leave. Leave all of that stuff at the firehouse. That is the best way to combat what we're doing um, right now. But we certainly don't want to um, not use our gear, which protects us very well um, from fires. It doesn't do a great job of protecting us from the gases, but that's another that's another conversation on when we do an episode just on occupational cancer and how to protect us. To be to be the devil's advocate, there is no way I could have been in the front seat with none of my gear on. And get a get a run three blocks away, or five blocks away, or ten blocks away, and get my gear on with my mask and be ready to go the second we pulled up. There's there's no way just because I was afraid of getting a little, uh, you know. I mean, listen, I signed up for that, right? So I understand what guys say, and I understand all that stuff, and, I, and you know, you could sell me on it, but you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't be ready to go to work. But, you know, I, I don't want to have my gear on because uh, of the boogeyman. You know what I mean? I don't want to get cancer, but you can't you cannot be ready to go to work, you know, driving down the street, you know, the way we drive down the street and uh, put your gear. There's no way you could put your gear on 
and and be ready to go and pull up and and, and be ready to. No, oh, I mean, and you're right, but it may mean in some cases it's going to mean that you got to pull over and put your gear on. I, I understand. I understand what you're saying, but um, I mean, the bottom line is we 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 got to do all we can to, and we got to balance it. You're 100. We got to balance it, right? But um, we got to find a way that we're um, we got to find a way that we're not killing ourselves because. You know, cancer is a huge problem in the fire service. The gear is oh, not the only the gear is not the only problem, right? As you're pointing out, um, but we got to make sure that um, that we do. If, it if I was can. worried, if 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 I was worried, and, and I am worried about getting cancer, but it probably was a fact, you know, that we didn't wear our mask. I mean, that's really that's the truth, right? So, I w- I was never worried about getting cancer from the gear. I'm not saying that you can't, and I'm not saying you know. Of course, it's I'm sure it's uh, proven. But that that's I was not worried about that. And uh, I, I just think that I, I watch some of these videos and um, I don't know. I just think that you have to be right. You can't have it both ways. You can't be aggressive and be, you know, rah, rah, rah. And everybody, let's get in there and, and go to work. But, you know, like that one woman that was in the window that we made fun of, the guy was putting on every piece of PEE, you know, like while the woman was in the window with smoke coming out over her head, some civilian jumped in the window and flipped the, the woman out, you know, outside the window because he was making sure he was he was all squared away. You know, so I'm just yeah, being I mean, obviously advocate. when you're leaving quarters and you're going to you're going on a run. Yeah. I mean, of course, you're going to put your equipment on. But if if you're out, if you're out for three hours out of quarters and you're wearing your gear. Yeah, I mean, no, I got you. I got you know, you. I think that's that's more of the you know. I if you're on the more... rig, if you're on the rig, for me, if you're on the rig, you have to have your gear on. It's just yeah, you got to put up, you got to put up with it. I mean, you got to put up with it. Yeah, but then so just know that there's a risk to that, right? I think if as long as you understand that there's a a potential risk to that, but you know to at least take the other steps, right? Wear your mask, do the other stuff. Yeah, clean, clean your, your stuff. Make sure you clean. Right. I, I agree with that. Shower yeah. after a job or something. Take time. I got that part. I, you know, I didn't always do that, but I understand that. And I no, and we it. didn't understand that there was a potential risk to our gear, right? So, the, you know, our AFFF foam, right? So the, the FDNY does not use AFFF foam anymore. Dude, if Two I see another ago, TikTok took... about this, I'm not even TikTok, sure what the hell. It's on the radio all the time. It's everywhere. I don't even yeah, know what the hell's going on. If you're a firefighter, you would use a triple F. I'm like, I used to eat that stuff for breakfast. What are you talking about? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so right, but we collected we collected all of the, all of the five gallon cans of a triple F foam that we had, and we took all of the fire extinguishers that we had. We didn't even tell you to take them and clean them out. We took them because we now know that the foam causes cancer, and to a degree, um, we don't we don't know the extent of it yet, but we've learned the same thing about some of the chemicals that are in our gear. But they're in a lot of other things, so we don't we don't yet fully know the hazard to it. So, and it's just something that we got to be aware of. Mm. Um, and you know, um, w- what we're wearing should not be killing us, right? And no, I I they, understand that. And they're they're moving they're moving towards that. But listen. I like you. I wore my gear, you know, all day long, all day long, you know, never thinking my gear could cause yeah. me a problem. Well, listen, I, I laugh all the time. You know, I'm sure you've, my mother smoked, my father smoked, my grandmother smoked. They smoked in the house, in the car, right? We laugh about that now, but now it makes so much sense. But that was the same thing with us, right? I mean, the fire service, it was kind of like you had to prove that you could take smoke, right? You would take your mask off as soon as you could in the FDNY, right? You see guys, you know, commenting now all the time. Oh my God, look at all those guys. They don't have their mask on. They're cutting the roof, whatever it was. But it's the same thing. I, I kind of uh, equated to, you know, my mother smoking in the sixties. You know what I mean? That's what they did, right? This is what yeah. we did. Now it's the 2020s, right? I get it. I'm just saying that it's got to be a balance there on some of the stuff too. No, that's right. No, and 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 one of the comments, right? The the rules are never more important than the mission. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna get the mission done, right? And whatever that means to you know, however however you deal with that, you know, um, and some some people are wearing the bunker pants and not the bunker coat. I mean, we're going out into the supermarket. I mean, there's so many things. It's again, it's all whatever level of risk you're willing to, you know you're willing to take that's, you know, um, and you know, firefighting is a dirty job. We're never going to eliminate all of the risks. That's for sure. Um, 
because you know we're gonna we're, we're gonna do what we got to do to save lives but um you know wearing it for the sake of wearing it uh sometimes doesn't no, really understand. make a lot of sense i understand hmm. that i understand and you know but i get what you're saying i want to be ready too I, I i get it but you know what about wearing it in the kitchen in the tv room how about that how about sitting in the <laughs> uh, on the fucking couch how about laying in my yeah, fucking you know, bed all, with all it, that time that ha that oh has christ oh my get to wars with hazmat. i would work 24 <laughs> hours we're not taking off my pants 24 <laughs> hours straight because yeah. to take them off would be the, to put them back on if it was 96 degrees out it was just impossible to do you know what i mean put my gear on um and then sometime after midnight when i went up to the rack i'd put them right next to my rack bed yeah i would put it next to the bed yeah that's right so you could jump in it so you would take that less yeah. less that's step right your fucking yeah. shoes on and taking them off again well like yeah. like Ruffy said we were talking about that on the way to syracuse right like when i was a kid i remember looking in my living room and it would be banked down. You'd have to look to see who was sitting on the couch. You know, but can you imagine that today? No way. I don't even let anybody smoke in my house. But, you know, my grandfather's smoking. My grandmother's smoking. <laughs> you know, you're like, who is that? Is that grandpa on the fucking couch? Can you imagine if somebody... Nobody even smokes on Earth anymore. I haven't seen somebody oh, pull out a cigarette in like 1925. It's changed. Your perspective Holy changes, Christ. you know? What was, well, what was yeah. the norm? Then well, that's what we're North saying. Day. That's what we're saying. Well, it's just it comes. Listen, it comes down to understand your risk. You gotta, you gotta know the risk to assume the. You know, you should try and know the risk to assume the risk, right? So, know the rules to break the rules. This same, hmm. same thing applies, right? Just know that there's a risk that we're not quite sure of. Yep. So, um, we don't walk in foam blankets anymore for that same reason, right? right. So, but um, would we walk in a foam blanket if we, if if we had to rescue somebody? You're damn right we would. That's what, we that's what we do because we're going to get the mission done. Excellent. I think uh, this discussion leads perfectly into our next question. Honestly, good, good segue, that? Tanky. I, I, I do try. I like his style. Looks like he's got two smiles with that mustache. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of y'all tell me what the safety chief does at a fire. I've always wanted to know, and I think that is to hear the voice of his men and women, and to still be a good voice of reason, <laughs> of safety and precautions to take care of them. Because he does this. Ready? He or Whoa. she takes care of <laughs> <Yeah. all laughs> <our> people. <laughs> Pulls the reins back. Yeah. Oh, 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 buddy. Yeah. I, I mean, it's 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 balancing. It's balancing the entire scene with the ability to be safe, right? I mean, that's that's the job. Uh, my job is not to be punitive. My job is to evaluate through a different lens, through the lens of safety, um, because we have an obligation to ensure, to the best of our ability, that if we leave with five, we come back with five. And um, I would say the chief of safety, <clears throat> the uh, the higher up you are on the organization, there's a pyramid, a safety pyramid. Our firefighters are at the bottom of that. They are eternal optimists, and they will do anything for you. <laughs> the right? mission. The mission. The firefighters are all about the mission 100% all the time. Because could you imagine a firefighter saying, Chief, I'm not going in there. The fire's out nine windows. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Have you ever had to tell somebody to get in the building? No. You got to say, uh, one more minute. Give me one more minute. We That's got it, right. Chief. We a get series it. Of one more minute. And you hear the bang, bang, bang. I'm like, what the hell are they doing in there? One more minute, Chief. One more minute, Chief. We Next thing you know, we're like 15 minutes in. And I'm like, you know, at some point, right? So the firefighter occupies the lowest level on the, on the pyramid, right? So they're not concerned. It's our job to have a concern for them. Now, the company officer is concerned about their firefighters. They have a little less risk tolerance, right? Then the, the, the battalion chief that gets there, he's a little, little less, and so on. And now the chief of safety gets there. If the chief of safety is reckless, there's no safety net for the chief of safety or for the incident commander, right? So if they don't pull you out of a building that's about to collapse or something's going to happen, then they're not doing a job, right? So because the firefighter has an understanding that you're looking out for them and their well-being. They're in there being as aggressive as we want them to be. But that's a two-way street. We got to make sure that we're looking out for them. Right? So mm. that's, you know. Um, so you say that, I, that you switch from 
tactical on how to put this fire out to looking at things that the chief, the deputy may not be looking at, which is, is it safe right now to put this fire out to keep the guys in there? Is, is what am I seeing in front of me? What what is unsafe to me? So that's basically yeah. And I'm running through the tactics as well, right? You know, the well, that's you because what we're doing. Right. You know, if we're if we're breaching the wall, um, because we, just because we want to get access and there's cracks in the wall and it's a vacant building, right? So I'm sorry, you know, whoever the loved ones are that um, you know your your husband or wife died at this fire. It was vacant, but we were having fun. We had already searched it, so we already knew no one was in there. Um, don't worry. Um, you could raise your three kids on your own, and there'll be a memorial there on that site. You know, it's, there's just there's just some times where I look at it, and, you know, and I, I had a fire um, earlier this year in Brooklyn in February where, you know, it was an unoccupied. It wasn't vacant. It was an unoccupied um, lumber warehouse. They were just storing their lumber. The, the building wasn't maintained. And, and that's what we had, right? We were trying to force entry into the structure that what was go well wrong done. With the lumber yard. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, at some point you got to say, uh, you know, we're not going to, um, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to risk, I'm not going to risk your life, nor should you want me to. Um, certainly your loved ones wouldn't want me to for a building that we know is no, is not occupied. Right. Um, and I think that that's the, uh, you know, I think that that's the, that's the, that's the biggest, I think that's the biggest thing, but you need, you know, um, you, you definitely have a, a greater degree of pessimism um, by nature of the job than, the, than the firefighter would. And I think that's by design and that's a, and that's a good thing. And uh, you know, risk versus reward. Yep. Chief, chief of safety. Yes. Yeah, sometimes he's the party pooper or she <laughs> I just you know, saw that, you know, gonna, that is, that is sometimes <laughs> true. I was going to um, put this up and I was going to say something. And I was going to be like, Hey, you know, I was going to defend our buddy, our yeah. brother here, chief Lee, because some chiefs of safeties can be party poopers, but the chief of safety of the FTNY, Frank Lee, you know what he does? When there's work to do, Chief Lee is doing the work. You had to go there. You had to go there. He knew the majestry was behind him. That's what it was. He goes, oh, the majestry is behind him? Let me hump some holes here. Hold on. That was actually courtesy of our buddy Skylar Fire. Oh. So never forget where you came from. And that's a two-way street, right? Firefighters don't – for a chief that doesn't forget where he comes from, um, you know, I always have – I always have um, the uh, – my firefighters' best interest uh, at heart. And I want to be aggressive and get in there and get after it. And so just as a defense of that video, by the way, right? So I was only on that hose line because the firefighters there – you know, so I've been asked a couple of times. There's a lot of firefighters there. Why did you have to get on the hose line? Like, I didn't have to get on the hose line. I got on the hose line because they had just broke their butts moving the line from one spot to another. And sometimes you just need to give the brothers and sisters a quick little hand. And 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 I'm good with that, right? I, I operated. I was on the hose line, you know, put, pulling it up. They would not have let me get on the nozzle, by the way. But um, I, I was just on it temporarily to help them out because we're all a team, right? We all want that fire to go out and they just needed a quick hand. But I preach all the time. If you have a tool in your hand, you're, you're not supervising the operation. You become, you become a tactician and, and not, and not well, doing your not job. Focusing on like you're yeah. saying, you're, you're watching out for everybody. If you're not, if you're helping somebody do something like that, you're not watching the whole, you know, quote unquote. Couldn't you have ordered operation. him to give you the nozzle? Yeah, but I'm not. A, I'm so listen. I'm not a. Like this, I'm not see above. these two over here. It's going these here. We're going here. I'm certainly not above getting on the line and getting dirty and helping out the brothers and sisters when they need to, because that's what it's all about, right? You can't say you're part of the team and then not act like you're part of the team. And you are part of the team, Chief Lee. No doubt. Behind Chief Lee in that video was another chief, the rescue battalion chief or somebody. I don't know his name, but that he was also helping pull that line too. Look at that. Chief yeah, Moore. yeah, Malcolm Moore. Yep, Malcolm Moore, the chief of SOC, was uh, was on there as well. Just wow. you know, Skyler didn't get a great video of him on the line. It only happened to get a good video of me on the wow. line. So you know, 
You can also, hide that big, big sign on your back, cheap for right. safety. Holy cheap for safety <laughs> and that's a 40 minute video that I obviously took 13 seconds of. And nice. that's about 35 or 36 minutes into that video. So the brothers, like the chief said, the brothers have been working for a long time on that job. They've been getting it. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think. But they... even still, as tired as they were. So, um, if I would have went to the nozzle firefighter and said, you know, I'm going to take the line, you know, <laughs> I. I would not have gotten a pleasant re reply. Yeah, no. Hell no. And if he would have gave me the nozzle, I, I would have been like, bro, are you kidding me? Yeah, it's like giving you it's like giving your can up to the officer. I'm not giving that? yeah, I'm not giving you my can. <laughs> yeah, who would to give you a can up, right? Probably. Three weeks on the from my cold yeah. dead body. I'm not giving you my tool. And no one in my company is giving you a tool either. You need We're to doing. use my halogen, get out of the way, and tell me what you want done. Oh, that's right. Exactly. I, like the, I like the frisky chief lead. Oh, that was that was right. That was a little frisky. A little frisky. <laughs> that's, uh, next, we're, what's next? We were doing a training at my volley house the other night, and there we had some newer members that are new in and stuff, and we were going over hand tools, and they had went to get some of the tools off the truck, and my wife looks at me with that little mischievous face, and she goes, are you going to get them with the tool trick? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, you're going to ask one of them for their tool and then tell them why they never give you their tool? And I was like, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Did he give it to you? Oh, yeah, somebody always does. Oh, you got to slap them then. So I started, and now people are going to know, but I'll give away my secret. Uh, I'll start it. I'll look at the group and I'll say, does anybody here think they're smarter than a fifth grader? Mm. Everybody, every group's got Excuse one. Excuse the word of the day. All right, go to the next one there. So All right. Uh, let's see. Boom. All right. Here's for our time frame. I feel like this is a good, important one that, that we got everybody besides me can uh, give some insight on this one. Jamal Thomas says, Chief Lou, you guys got any words of wisdom for a newly promoted LT? Hmm. We've covered that a few times, I'm sure. I have, but I don't recognize that name, so he may be newer to us. You what going you first, Lou, or you want me to go first? I don't care. You can go first. You might want to go first, Lou, so you actually get a chance. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I ain't saying shit. I know nothing about that, bro. Yeah. Uh... I mean, I would say, I think what I've, I've always said is that uh, you, you, you represent, as, as the chain of command, as the chief would say, the chain of command, you, you represent the guys. So you really always have to have their back. And I think that that will always, you know, again, I'm not saying, you know, for stupid stuff, but uh, if you feel like the guys were right or if there's any issues that you, you represent them and that you have to step up. And that's that's kind of what your job is, obviously, making sure that they always go home. But don't don't be something you're not. I was never going to be captain, you know, uh, or, or any I was never going to be Lieutenant Lee. I was never going to be Lieutenant Urban. I was never going to be any of those guys. So I just because firemen smell fake really fast. So I think that it's important to be yourself. Act, You know, I'm not that type of uh, I'm a friendly guy. I like to laugh. Some of my bosses never did that. So I wasn't going to be like that. So you have to be yourself, but at the same time, you have to be firm. You know, don't let friendliness become, uh, a, you know, think that it's, you're, you're being weak. So you always have to be firm and uh, stand up for yourself. But as a newly promoted lieutenant, I would just, uh, you know, try and uh, I would just try and start out slow. You know, don't try to do too much right out of the box. I like that. So this is a good question for the old school tip today. So um, since we probably, you probably weren't going to get to that tonight. So I'm going to consider this the old school tip of the day here. The music for that. <laughs> <laughs> you got music for that. <laughs> it's like, I see him scrambling. Yeah, I knew it was coming. So here we go. Boom, 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 boom. So, um, firefighters want you to have a standard. Show your firefighters you love them by having a standard and hold them accountable because that's when you raise the bar and you achieve really great things. And a new officer sometimes misses that and decides that he'd rather be a friend and have no rules than be a leader and lead and realize that not only does he have friends, that the firefighters are his friends, but he also has the respect and also operates at a much higher level than he would have had he not operated that way. I remember one time uh, 
I forget who the heck it was. I, I remember who it is, but we went out to, uh, we went fishing for a couple of days, you know, and, uh, you know, when we're away, it's Frank, right? It's, it's tank. It's whatever it is when, we, you know, if we're, we're not in the firehouse, you know, and then we come back to the firehouse and I had a, co I think I had one new guy and that particular guy I was away fishing with came over to me and said something like, uh, you know, Hey Louie, uh, you know, what, what time are we going out for the meal or whatever the heck he said, but he called me Louie in front of this guy. And I was just like, who the fuck is Louie? You know, like that. And he went like this, he went like this, he went, you know, like, so I said, we're going to fucking go out in about a half hour. So I go upstairs and then the guy comes upstairs. And again, like the chief was saying, like, I said, get in here, and close the door. So he came in. I'm like, what's the matter with you? I said, I don't give a shit what you call me. Don't call, you don't call me Louie in front of the new guy. Like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like, have some, uh, what, what's the matter with you? When we're on the side, you can call me Louie. I don't give a shit, but you cannot. I would never call. I know Steve Kubla my whole life. I would never show up to the, to the command center and say, hey, Steve, you know, what do you got for me? Because I know him. It's just, it's a respect thing, you know, in front of people, you do that. If, if we were on the side of something, that, that would be a different story. But you just, I never, have, you I never know. even called him Steve. In the <laughs> I called him, I called him Chief. I, and that's right. It's just, it's, and that's a great cool. point, right? I know Joe Wiz for a very long time, right? Driver Joe. And he calls me Frank. He calls me all sorts of names. Um, <laughs> Don't call right? me late for dinner. Stupid, everything, right? He, he never calls me late for dinner, right? Lots of different things. But, um, when we are on the scene of something, he, he always calls me chief. Never does he, you know, uh, and that's that, that, that discipline, right? That res that, that respect that he doesn't want to, he, the last thing he wants to do is, is disrespect show you. Right. Yeah. He's, he's mm -hmm. going to disrespect you in front of somebody else. That's the worst thing a guy can do that works quote unquote works for you with you is to do that. Exactly. Right. I would, I'm yeah. 55 years old. I'm still calling people chief when I call them up on the phone, or if I see the chief mm. here, or, you know, I'm still calling them that. It's a respect. Yeah. Thing, you know what and I mean? And when Wiz does that, he'll be he'll call me at home and he'll be like, "Hey, chief," and I'm like, "What's with the chief shit?" I'm like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, it's just a respect thing. You know what I mean? Cat mm -hmm. Murphy. I remember, you know, some mm -hmm. of those guys say like, "Hey, Lou, you're a lieutenant now." Uh, you know, you can call me Dennis. I'm like, all right, chief, it's never going to happen. <laughs> you know, yeah. right? It's just, it's how it is. You know what yeah. I mean? He's always going to be a chief to me. It's fine. I'm good with it. It doesn't, you know. Yep. But at, at work, you know, it, it shows. And I used to, I used to feel like that was, again, if I was very close with somebody, even if Coobs, you know, again, it was easy for me too. I was a Lou, you know, hey, Lou, you know. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like, you know, you had to, you know, Louie, you had to, you had to add on another syllable. You know what I mean? Just, uh, just call me. Yeah. Lou. But, you know, Hank used to say that all the time. Are you calling me Lou or are you calling me Lou? You know? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I, I still call Hank, see you do. I don't even call him Hank. SD, baby. No, you just call me Hank. I call you Hank sometimes. Or we could call him Frank. Well, you could call me Frank. So, Hank, what else you got? We're coming up on two hours and I, I, Promise myself. Oh, like, part three. All right, here we God, go. holy <laughs> mackerel. All right, here we go. Simple, <laughs> easy, potentially a short answer. What made you decide to become the chief of safety? Uh, they told me one day you're going to be the chief of safety. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was an easy one. But I'll bump. There you go. Like, this is chief lead. This is how it is. You used to be chief of the rock. Now you choose safety. Yeah. So, um, yeah that's, that's, yeah, that's it. Next yeah. question. Now, hold Next on. This, question. this is him right now. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did ask before, uh, any plans to be chief of department? We've had that. Negative. No, I have no plans for that. Um, I think um, I think we have uh, uh, we have some great guys in that position, in those positions right now um, with Chief Hodgins. At the helm, Chief Esposito, our Chief of Operations. I, I do believe um, I do believe that Chief Esposito will be the next Chief of Department. Um, he he does a great job. He's uh, you know he's a forward thinking individual. He's uh, he's Who's fantastic. That, Johnny? And it, yeah, <laughs> Johnny he started. In, yeah, he started in started in Engine Three Twenty Four. So yes, got, I know. Then he went to Engine Eighteen, then Squad Eighteen. Yeah, he's got he's got great pedigree, right? We know where he's been. He's uh, he's great. And like I said, the, the, the members that took the deputy test today, the future's in good hands. They don't need me to be chief of the department. They're, oh, they'll be you, need, 
Dude, they need you on that wall, you right, Rofi? They'll be on that wall. They'll be fine. My favorite line. You want, you want Lee on that wall. down in places you, need... you don't like to talk about in parties. parties. <laughs> They'll be fine. Hey, hey I, keep, I keep seeing these questions about drones. Somebody asked about the FDNY drones, correct? Yeah, yeah. there is a guy. I'm going to be real honest. The question is really hard to understand. I've already asked him to reword it for us, so we'll see if he does. In the meantime, we'll hit this question up. Chris Burke asks, is there a fire from outside of the U.S. that Chief Lieb has an interest in from different tactics used and also any teaching points that the FDNY could slash have learned from? Ooh, that's that could be a whole episode. Um, yeah, so there's a there's a listen, I was in um, I was in London a couple of days after the Grenfell T Tower fire. Um, I was there to speak at a high rise fire safety conference. Uh, so I obviously had some interest in that. I went and spoke to some of the first two firefighters there. Um, I think um, in Nice, France, the uh, I visited the station there that was first due at the um, at the uh, they responded to the truck that drove down the uh, promenade there. So yeah, you're we'd be foolish if we don't learn from fires and incidences uh, anywhere anywhere they are. Some of the exterior cladding fires that have been all around the world, um, you know, if we're not careful and, and make sure that we have proper building codes, you know, we could have those. And there's certainly plenty of lessons from fires that we could um, learn. And sometimes we don't um, from, from inside, you know, from inside the country. Again, that's the, the reasoning for our remembrance bulletins and the reason for that, that book we mentioned, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Specific ones. There's, there's, there's so many that you can go to. Um, and I always, I look at them at, um, evaluate what they did based on their staffing, based on their buildings, based on the tactics they use. Um, in some areas of the world, they use different tactics because they have different, uh, you know, their buildings are constructed differently. That's a, a major, a major part of it. I mean, you can see when cities are built cities that use a lot of, uh, brick or a lot of cement and not a lot of wood, you know, at different time periods when wood was <clears throat> More expensive or well, labor was expensive or you know those type of things impacted a lot when you really look into the to the history of those but um but good uh, good question so i see they're asking about an auc for uh yes. for tones yeah. um yeah so this this, this right tones, here was the initial question but if you're saying it go ahead and answer it uh let's see technical difficulties enough to follow um essentially the second question was uh, what is FDY training and where are the AUC? Yeah, so training. we have our, our drone procedures is run our drones are run out of our command tactical unit. They do a fantastic job of, of the drones. Um, uh, I was a non-believer of the drones early on uh, until I had a fire. I think I spoke about the fire. Uh, actually, it wasn't even a fire. It was a collapse of a cast-in-place building when I was uh, acting deputy chief. I was a battalion chief and I had that. And um, the drone operator came up to me and he shows me an iPad. He's like, chief, here's the area to collapse. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty good. Um, but it's always evolving. As far as written procedures, we don't really, we don't really have many. Um, we can certainly, um, I, if someone needs to have procedures for their department or something like that, I can certainly put you in touch with uh, somebody in our drone unit. Um, I mean, you could honestly, you could search it online. Um, we have several of our people in our drone unit. Uh, listen, you're probably—I'm surprised they haven't chimed in on the chat. I'm sure I would, you know, I know some of them listen to, to this, but these guys travel internationally, training other departments in the dro drone use. They are—I mean, the talent that they have with them is is really amazing. Did, so we do don't have, have a special lot. special call them, or do they come at a. At they a come moment. automatically on a second alarm. And then as a staff chief, I'll get a notification to my phone that the drone is up and I can watch the drone video. Well, that's good for you coming in, right? It's, it's amazing. The, the amount of information that I have responding today um, is, is fog. It's, it's really incredible. Uh, and my fear was I don't need more background noise to just sift through more information that maybe not be valuable. But looking at a drone video... Of, of say that that building that I had um, you know a localized collapse it was very useful to see that only for 30 seconds and then move along I I see it I understand it now I understand the the area that's involved uh, and I could deploy resources uh, based on that so hmm. but 
you know, we've seen it with it now has infrared cameras on it. We've seen how how valuable that is as well. Um, oh shit! They have infrared now. Yeah, so we can see if the building's in the other wing of a of an H type. Wow. We can see fire in the other wing. Water on the fire. Yeah. Right. 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 Wow. Yeah. Uh, this, this guy's asking this question repeated. Why didn't you bring McBride on the show with you? Because <laughs> he's busy. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, he's arranging a sock drawer. What? Uh, yes. Where do they turn out of the field? Come. That's Mike Elmhurst Buff, who, who's asking that question. Who knows McBride from when he lived in Elmhurst? Hmm. Yeah, we grew up with Bride being where, where do they turn out? Uh, Sock Island. They are Island. Still at Sock Island? All right. Yeah. So there's times I've been citywide where I've gone there, and they, those the guys that are in the drone unit are so into the job that um, they love to show you, you know, uh, Mike Leo and his crew. They love yeah, to. Leo was very good at that. Technology. They'll put up the drone, and you're like, it's the evolution of the drone has, has been – the technology in that area has really been, uh, you talk about the acceleration of technology, it's certainly in that area. Do we have a chief that also turns out the helicopter from Floyd Bennett? Third yeah, alarm. so a high-rise chief will turn out on a uh, on a third alarm. Right. He'll go to be the air recon chief, and he goes to Floyd Bennett, usually the 5-8 or the 3-3 battalion will, will be assigned as the air recon. And again, that's on, you know, typically on high-rise buildings. But when you look at line of duty deaths, when you look at the history in the American Fire Service, um, one Meridian Plaza fire in Philadelphia, they, they landed people on the roof. So, you know, we've maybe we've learned from, maybe we've learned from that. And, uh, you know, so and there's still I see some of the comments about the about the Dalmatian. The Dalmatian's still learning. Right. He's he's a probie. So he's got he still has to learn to negotiate steps, maybe. But um, but he's getting there. He's getting better. Oh, What's the Dalmatian? It's the, the robot, robot dog. Get yeah. in the job, would you? What are you doing? Yeah. Don't get on he, it. Um, get well, he, 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 out uh, of the room. I think he he, uh, <laughs> he fell at um, at one of the uh, I believe at the garage collapse. It was. Mm. Uh, he fell. But well, you'll see. Just like the drones, in a couple of years, you know that's that's the learn that's a learning curve, right? There's some learning going on there how we can utilize them as the technology gets better. Um, and that's something that we'll say, how did, how did we operate without them? You know, at some, maybe it's talk about that on episode 16. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Look at Ruffy all of a sudden throwing him in there. Look at that. Yeah. Cause he sees we're at almost two hours. He's like, come on. Oh, that's it. We're wrapping it up. <laughs> Ruffy's like this. <laughs> Wrap it up. All right. Come on. You got any more now? That's uh, that's about it really. What? What? I say what? It was, and I was like, "What?" You're like, "What?" Like, you Francis, did you read all those books? I I read most of them. So when I when I went to the Naval Postgraduate School, when they um, so they said it's an 18 month program, right? The master's program, but then um, so class starts in September, but in June, so this is, you know, I graduated from that in 2016, so you know, 18, 20 months earlier than that. They um, they uh, they send me a box of, of books. Eighteen books arrive in the mail, and they said, um, "Yeah, by your first in residence in September, read all these and do a two page book report on each of them." Eesh. So, I spent my summer um, reading Eesh. and reading and reading. reading. So I have a lot of the, the books. The majority of the books that's the, the majority of books you see are the buff books. The educational books are on the uh, um, are more on the sides. You don't uh, got this book, do you? Of me. <laughs> never oh, far. It's never far away, my brother. Never That's far uh, away. isn't that the book that you gave him when he was crying about it? Uh, how come I don't get a book? Neither is my tips from training book. Um, they're asking. They're asking to see the away. QR code again, fam. So I'm just going to put it up. Keep talking. Do it. I got a lot of books on my desk. Look what I got. There you go. Yeah, again, that's to the that's to the QR code for my um, uh, for my LinkedIn, and it also will have a... there's, there's a ton of information on there, and there's links to different websites that are uh, um, you know that are important, and there's a way to contact me in there as well. So, um, you know, for those that actually need the uh, a contact with the um, you know with our drone unit, that's a good way to to, to reach me. And we'll put the link for that as well in the description on the audio side and on 
YouTube after the show's over and we can go back and edit those things. So if you're not watching it and you're just listening to us, go find that link tree code in the description. Well, I got a better idea. If you just listen to us, get over and subscribe so we can build up the subscription. Oh, I got that one too. That's also okay. true. Yeah. Oh, wow. Look, he's looking Chief like Daly that. saying that the drone program originated from a display at the Naval Postgraduate School in 2013. It's such a brilliant audience. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean that's. I, I mean they were back in back in those days. A lot of the um, uh, many people were writing their thesis on the drone program. There was a um, a, a really good report done by one of the people uh, um, that I went to school with, um, Greg Favre. He did a um, uh, he did a really good paper on drones and. Um, you know, so early on, while we were still learning it, and the FDNY drone program was really in its 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 infancy uh, back then. It's like I said, our job. You think about, you know, does anybody there's people that have tech that are into the technology and into the drone program, and the next thing you know, here we are, and we have these uh, experts working in the unit, and that's the case for every unit that we have on the job that people find their 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 niche, niche. In, in what they want to do, and it's really amazing. Coops, tell them. There's an ass for every seat. There it is. <laughs> you know, they actually just started. I was going to tell Chief Daly, they have a drone. Like, so if when you bow hunt, make a long story long, you could shoot a deer and the deer could run three, four, five hundred yards. You might lose blood. You might not be able to find it. Usually you used to go get a dog. Now they have companies that have drones that go up in the air and they could look for the heat signature of the deer even the next day. And that they're finding these deer that people would have lost because of, of the technology. And the guy's making a few uh, bucks too. I know that. That's yeah. Nobody cares about hunting, Ruffy. <laughs> no, that's hockey. I oh, got a lot right. of I got a lot of sports that nobody cares about. <laughs> nah. Everybody loves killing poor defenseless animals. It's good stuff. You like eating it, don't you? I well when you, <laughs> you're, you're exactly right. Somebody's gotta kill it. I'll eat got it. Em. You got me. Got him. Where's my pepperoni, by the way? I didn't get any pepperoni this year. I didn't do the pepperoni. I only got one dough this year. It was a tough, uh, tough year this year. Oh, it was hard to spread that around. All right. All right. Anybody got anything before we wrap it up? Chief, great. Uh, I The um, information that comes out of this two hours is amazing. I'm not being, you know, a, di a dick. I'm, I'm being uh, honest. The, uh, I get <laughs> I'm not being... Uh, <laughs> nah, you know what? It's... Uh, Dick. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to come on. You know, you guys are uh, you guys are great, and like I like I've always said, I know you, I know you guys a very very long time. So yeah, and, uh, always loyal to my friends. Always loyal. Be always be loyal to your people. Your peeps, right? So Chief Lee will be on the uh, pin the queue tomorrow night. What time is that on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Dude, just day was he was loving you, and then he just threw you right under oh, the maybe? bus. Nah, it's, love nah, it's, it's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. What did they say? If they didn't love you, they wouldn't break your balls, right? This is true. That's it. All right, you want to take us out there, uh, just on the extra uh, on the uh, exit there before we uh, say our goodbyes. Yeah, Thank we you. we can play that little video that. MC worked hard to make for us. Here you go, fam. Well, thank you, first and foremost, for tuning in to another episode of the Getting Salty Experience. Think we're out of good content? Ha! Far from it. If you want to find us on the audio side, you can do so on all the players. We're available on, yes, I said that correctly, all the players. Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts, that's where we are. And if you're here tonight, congratulations. You found us on the Getting Salty Experience, which if you're not already subscribed, please do so. It's free, cost you nothing. You can also like and share, which also costs you nothing and helps us grow the audience of the show. You can also find us on social media if you so please. Of course, we're on Instagram where Lou posts great FDNY content from yesteryear. We're also on TikTok. Tangum is Prime is on top of that. And we're also on LinkedIn too, where yours truly, Mike McBob Cologne, is on top of things on that front. Head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com, by the way, for all kinds of great merchandise, apparel, and accessories. There is a super chat, too. We thank each and every one of you for your support. You can open up your wallet and donate a amount of your choosing during the program. After all, you guys, yes, you guys are our number one sponsors. Super thanks as well. If you missed the show live, you can show support 
through that means. If you still wish to open up your wallet, the super thanks is basically a thank you after the fact for another great episode of ours. The Facebook fan page is in existence too, now over 60,000 strong and continuing to grow. It's not created by us at the Getting Salty Experience, but it is nevertheless a great way to connect with firefighters from all over and fans of the show alike. If you want to advertise with the Getting Salty Experience, send your information on over to gettinsaltyads at gmail.com. And if you have any questions or have a guest suggestion, please send them to gettinsaltyexperience at gmail.com with the necessary contact information. And finally, if you have content for anything else, please send them to koobspodcast at gmail.com. Of course, that's Kevin Kubler's secondary email. And that's where you could send things like rig photos, firehouse kitchen tables, fire videos, helmet cam videos, tattoos, mustache photos, and yes, photos for the unofficial Hot Old Ladies contest that we may or may not be holding, allegedly. Thanks once again for tuning in to the Getting Salty experience. All right, yes, and send those to Coop's podcast for the next couple of days because we're going to go back and do a couple of cock and cocktails. We're going to take two of them over the weekend. So if you want your company or your friends or fires or whatever the hell it is, send it over. Red Rover, Red Rover, send it over. Chief, thank you so much. Again, appreciate it. We'll have you back on. And we'll be seeing you August 5th. Thank Baltimore. you, brothers. Yes, yes. You yep. will, uh, yeah, looking forward, uh, looking forward to that. After all, you're you're your three time guest here. You gotta have you on. It goes without saying. Plus, plus, don't forget the four welcome to the rocks, right? Those are my uh, the highlights of my career. You know right. what? We True. Did, you know, you might be the most viewed guy on getting salty, bro. I think so someone's gotta try and keep he up definitely with is. Teddy Ray. Yeah. yeah. Right? Oh Hank, maybe Hank. And Hank, yeah. Oh so Hank's up gotta, there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah Hank. You have a couple of guys that were, you know, heavy hitters on the show that were heavy hitters in their career too, right? So uh Yeah. It's good stuff, man. I think right. Chief Lee Part One might still have the most views of any getting salty video. Yeah. Just maybe, mm, allegedly, it's going to happen. Well, we'll see. Hopefully, he has it again. We can now. Regret. Regret. People are getting tired of me, right? They're like, oh, leaves on again. <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boys. So Monday we have uh, what's it, uh, Baloo's daughter, right, Roof? Trina Baloo, yeah. Yeah, Trina Baloo's coming on. And then Thursday, we have Stamp Pipes with Chief Norman and uh, the uh, Sultan of the Stamp Pipe, I think. Timmy, Timmy Clett. Yeah, we're going to do a whole thing on Stamp Pipe, so tune in. The Wizard of Water, Timmy Clett. The Wizard of Water, the Bro of H2O, the Sultan <laughs> of the Stamp Pipe, all of that. You know it. you got to come up with some more. Uh, well, don't believe me. I'm already starting. <laughs> myself, so. I'll, I'll, I'll think of a couple. All right. All right, guys. We'll see you Monday night. Have a great weekend. Love you guys. Stay low and yo. All right, everybody. We'll see you at the big one. Much love, fam. We'll see y'all on the fire floor.